Yes, I'm Batman. I'm Batman. I'm Batman, Alfred. I'm Batman. I am Batman! I'm Batman. I'm Batman. I'm Vengeance. Greetings, Bat Family, and welcome back to Holy Batcast, brought to you by Real Fans for Real Movies. Make sure you visit our website, holybatcast.com. It's your one-stop shop for all things Holy Batcast. You can also find us all over the internet on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Just search for Holy Batcast, and you will find us. Um, we are also on Patreon. If you love the show, you want to help support the show, you can do that on Patreon, patreon.com slash holybatcast. And got to give a shout out to our latest patron, Mr. Chris Salica. Hi, Chris. Um, I don't know your name, so nice to meet you. Uh, yeah, he uh, he gave us a, a little, little patronage and a very sweet message just about how much he enjoys the show, which is always much appreciated. I appreciate the patronage, but I appreciate even more the kind words because uh, I think it's 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 wor- words of endearment is my love language. What's your love language, guys? I don't know. Um, anyway, so Chris, I do appreciate it. Uh, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Welcome to the family. Uh, someone on Twitter was like, "Hey, you should." Every patron, you should make them a, a citizen of Gotham. And I'm like, I like that idea. Uh, I don't even know where to start. I could start with Chris here. I don't. I, I could just give him a random role. He could be Mr. Zaz, because we were just talking about Mr. Zaz before we started <laughs> recording. So, Chris, congratulations. You're Mr. Zaz. I hope you like him. Uh, he's real creepy, but, you know, he's fun, and he's been around, and we're getting another one in Batwoman, so... Congratulations. Anyway, again, thank you to our patrons. You guys are awesome. That's patreon.com slash holybatcast. If you don't do it, I don't blame you. But if you do do it, you're awesome. And we love you. Um, as always, I'm Andy DiGenova. You know that. You can follow me on Twitter or on Instagram. It's just my name, Andy DiGenova. Get ready for lots of Halloween posting. Um, we're part of the Real Fans Podcast Network. All those shows are at rf4rm.com. Now, this episode, as I warned you last time, we're actually making it happen. We are going to be looking at Detective Comics number 1027. That's right. A comic book episode, y'all. You know what that means? means nobody's downloading it um but that's okay we do we do this for us uh and it's it's another momentous big special comic and we love that and we want to talk about it we're also going to review the next episode of batman beyond and catch up on some of your emails joining me for all this fun and even more it is my bat brother you just heard his puppy who's so excited that he's gonna she get she gets to be on the podcast as well it's jamie drooley hey jamie and you said something about comic books, and she just flipped her wig because she's used to the morning habit of me coming downstairs and letting her outside and making a cup of coffee and sitting down and reading comics while she sits at my feet. Oh, so that's she, adorable. She knows the routine. That's great. I love that. Um, well, it's good. To have two episodes in a row, Jamie. What? I know. It's almost like normalcy's back in effect or something. Almost. Well, we'll see if we can keep the streak going. <laughs> no promises. <laughs> uh, we also have a very special guest. He is an old friend of the show. Uh, we we get emails from him. He's been on the show before. He was on our Dark Knight Returns episode way back when, 100 years ago. Um, and uh, he has dabbled in podcasting himself. I don't even know if you, do you have a current podcast happening right now. I've lost track. Are you are you semi-retired? Uh, uh, uh. I still, uh, me and Rob Myers are still uh, doing the Everyone Loves Young Justice podcast. Uh, ah. But uh, my my the, my own show, Comics Now, we sadly decided to uh, uh, close the doors on that just for personal reasons, uh, just to, in time reasons too, because you know who has that anymore. Uh, but um, but yeah, still kind of dabbling, and uh, I've guessed it on a couple. Uh, I was on the Batman Book Club. A couple months ago, and uh, yeah, I've, I've been around in a couple of a uh, couple of uh, podcasts here and there. See, you're never truly gone. I didn't say your name, but anyway, it's Jay Yaws. Welcome back, Jay Yaws. Good to have you back. Thank you. I'm uh, glad to be back. Thanks for uh, having me back on. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I was on the Dark Knight Returns episode back in the before times. So uh, you know, we'll see how things are. You know, in uh, whatever we want to call this this year going on right now. <laughs> 
yeah, we're we're in the midst of the apocalypse. We're not quite to post-apocalyptic. We're po- we're just apocalyptic right now. Like um, what Mad Max, like the first one, that was kind of intermediate between that and then after that that kind of just went all hell broke loose and everything right i've only seen all those movies once so forgive me if i made a crappy reference there but you know that's the best one i could pull out uh, of thin air that's okay (laughs) i know it's more it's more like water world (laughs) okay got it we're we're in the moment where the ice caps are melting we're not in water world yet but it's coming i mean I, I just assume we get to the post-apocalyptic thing so that I can make use of my assless chaps and get my hair done in the red spiky rooster <laughs> mohawk thing. No, no, I, 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 Andy and I were speaking the same language with Waterworld there. So, um, <laughs> yeah, let's go with that one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is a terrible confession to make, but like, yeah, I, the Mad Max I know the best is Fury Road because it's the recent yeah, one. Same. But like, yeah, like the... I saw, I think I've only seen one of the originals and I don't even remember which one it was. It wasn't, it wasn't beyond Thunderdome because I would have remembered Tina Turner. So it was one of the yeah, other two. You would remember Tina Turner. <laughs> so yes, I am also not a Mad Max uh, aficionado, which is why I went to Waterworld because yes. I'll, I'll get down on some Waterworld with you. 25 years this year. Happy 25 Waterworld. Heck yeah. Heck yeah. So, yep. Uh, I'm investing in I, jet I, skis. I smell a real fans episode coming. <laughs> oh man, I want to. <laughs> uh, all right, so um, good to have you back, Jay. It's a pleasure. And yes. yeah, we, we we knew it was going to be a comic book episode. And Jamie gets credit. Jamie's like, you know, Jay Oz, he misses talking comics on Comics Now. And I was like, oh, Jay's always welcome. Like the door is always open to you. So it's good to have you back. Yes, yes. Thank you very much for inviting me back. Thanks, Jamie, for the recommendation. And uh, yeah, glad to be here. Can't wait to talk about this. Well, not only do I genuinely enjoy the the company of your soothing voice, but <laughs> people, you will not find anybody with a more encyclopedic knowledge of comics in anywhere that I've seen, anyway. Well, and my secret is fast Google thumbs. Uh, oh, is that what it that, is? <laughs> that's like eighty seven percent of it, Jamie. It's, right. it's being able to Google really quick. Well, but, and that's just it. Okay. Is you've been you've been a mainstay on the show, even though you haven't appeared on the show. Because anytime a character comes up, where me and Jamie go, I don't know, I don't know who this is, and they go, you know who would know? Jay Yaws. Yeah, 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 I know. Yeah, I always get a little get a little warm fuzzy whenever I hear my name. So, as far as know, reputations that... go, that's not a bad one. Yeah, I don't want to be like the um actually guy. Which you're I hope not. I don't come you're not. That way. You've, ne- no, no, you've, I, you've never been it that. It never guy. comes uninvited. That's the incredible part about it. Like you have know-it-alls, and then you have the encyclopedic people. And to me, you're the encyclopedic people. So that's good to know because I have so much self-awareness that I am always terrified that I'm coming across the wrong way. So I'm glad I'm not coming across the wrong not way. Not at all. Not Vegan at all. I've never, I've never seen you as the kind that just pushes the glasses up onto the bridge of your nose and is like, actually. <laughs> yeah. Uh, pe- uh, peek into my psyche right there. You know, just uh, so you know, you know, my flavor of anxiety and everything. So <laughs> Nice. Uh, yeah, no, I get it. And it was, it was just, that's the funny thing is I don't mind – Someone who knows more than me giving me that information, I only mind if they're a cunt about it. And you never are. It's so weird actually hearing that word and not hearing dead air for about a second. For, for, for a split <laughs> second. Um, yeah. Well, it's big, I mean, it's because Brendan isn't here, but much like you, he is here in spirit. And so that just, he's always around. And uh, apparently I live in, was it I live in the Australia of the United States or Australia is the you, Texas You live in North world. Australia. I live in North Australia. <laughs> and Brendan, li- Brendan <laughs> lives in South Texas. Okay, there we go. It's just when I picture Australia and I picture Texas, it's not that different. You know, there's a lot of dust, there's tumbleweeds, there's big hats. Like, to me, feels similar. Kangaroos, armadillos, they're kind yeah, of the same thing. Right? Texas, they're arm. And the reason is because Australia, they don't have guns. In Texas, they have all the guns. So that's why the kangaroos need to be armored. Uh, Mm. I live around the uh, armadillo's natural habitat, which is dead on the side of the road. Oh, man. (laughs) Dude, I... Sorry. 
two years ago before I moved to China, me me and my my dear friend Scott Hopkins, who I do Why Not Futurama with, he's from Texas. So he knows all, all oh, about really? it. Yeah, he's from Texas. And he's from Texas. He's like from the Texas Louisiana border, so he gets to claim both I was states. Say, why did I think he was from Louisiana? He's from he's from both. It was like he was on one side of the border until like junior high and then he moved to the other side of the border after that. So <laughs> Uh, but it's yeah, right there. But anyway, the point is right before I moved to China, he and I took that, that Twister road trip, um, where we went to all the filming locations of Twister, but we started in Texas and yeah, if we had a dollar for every armadillo on the side of the road, our trip would have been paid for. It was crazy. You you could have paid for an armadillo nature habitat to keep the armadillos from dying on the freeway. <laughs> oh my God. I mean, I, I, I just hope that I, it seems like they're procreating. So it's not uh, taking a huge dent out of their population, but like it just made me so sad. And then, yeah, I got numb to it after day two. Cause it was yeah. insane. Yeah. Oh, another armadillo. Yeah. I bet that was a fun road trip though. Oh not my to, God. You know, the labor, what we actually, you know, have the show about, but a twister road trip. That's awesome. Dude. It was, there, it was an all time twister with Andy. Always. It was it was an all timer, you know, like just going with your best what friend, going the to the experience? weirdest locations ever was just a blast. And I rented a big red truck, just like in Twister. <laughs> and the Twister and I, score and soundtrack were were taking turns on the stereo for three days straight. And I have no doubt anytime you wanted to stop for food, you said food, food, food. <laughs> it's been too long since I've seen that movie, so I need to re- revisit it. Isn't that on Peacock? I don't know. I don't know. What? What more important question? Did you leave the lemonade on the roof? No, I will never make that mistake. <laughs> that that it, <laughs> twenty-five years, and it still bugs me. Uh, not twenty-five years. Well, Twenty-four. Twenty-four. It'll be twenty-five next year. Uh, anyway, sorry, we got on a twister tangent. Whoops. Uh, let's let's talk about Batman and comic books. Okay. Hey. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. That's why we're here. Uh, all right. Great. So yes. Um. I think it was you even said it, Jamie, when we did Detective Comics number one thousand. You go. We're gonna do this again really soon. <laughs> Because when they do, when they hit 1027, you know they're going to make it another collector's edition. And sure enough, they did, uh, which I'm not mad at. I, I really enjoy these collector's editions they've been doing. Like when it was, um, yeah, when it was Detective Comics 1000, and then they did the uh, the Robin 80 special, and the Joker 80 special, and the Catwoman 80 special. They did the Batman 80 special too, right? Like, or was that was that Detective 1000? No, that wouldn't have been Detective uh, 1000. That would have been something. There was, there, there was like a... Well, there's two different things they do. They've done like like this, like Detective One or 1027. That's just like an issue with a bunch of different stories. They've also done like 80 years of, you know, so and so that collects like, you know, Detective 27 and then Batman number one. And then, you know, a bunch of notable comics Mm, from over the years. So so it's kind of, you know, there's two different things, both doing the same thing, just in different ways. Got it point is i'm sure there are some comics fans who are a little cynical about it being like uh you know another excuse to to gouge us for 10 bucks for a book but i don't mind like i i think it's fun i like it and what i like is i like the talent they compile to do these special issues i think it's really fun i like that the and i like that these big special issues are one-offs you can just you can just buy it and enjoy it, and then you're done. Uh, it doesn't mean well, they don't they don't always stories. tease. Uh, yeah. They always tease other stories in there, which we'll talk about. But uh, you don't have to bite. Oh, Action Comics 1000. That was the other one I was thinking of. I was like, God, I knew there was another one. Um, but yeah. There's, so, apparently, there's a Green Lantern 80th anniversary special out there that got by me, and I had to have my comic book shop track down a copy of that from their other store. Ah, okay. I don't even remember that one being solicited somehow. I don't either. I mean, it came out during, you know, quarantine and everything. So, I mean, it 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 was easy to slip by. Like, I think I don't even think I remembered it was coming out until it came out and I, you know, read it. And I was like, oh, okay, there you go. Green Lantern 80. So, uh, yeah, you're you're not alone in not even knowing it was coming. 
I felt that way about the Catwoman and Joker ones too. Like I knew they were coming, but then they got postponed because of uh, COVID. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, after I forgot about them for a while and then they just kind of, you know, dropped in shops and it's like, Oh, okay. That, that's, that's out now. Cool. Yeah. I have the Catwoman, Robin and Joker ones. And they're all, they all just keep getting pushed to the bottom of my stack. Cause I'm like, Oh, these aren't any kind of continuity thing. So, you know, and then I don't keep up with my reading and, you know, I have a six inch stack of stuff that I'm backlogged on now. And then I keep putting Batman and deceased on top of everything else. So yeah, I'll, I'll get to those in 2026 sometime. <laughs> I, guess. I was glad I was in the States for the Robin one. Cause I was a able to get it physically, but for Joker and Catwoman, I just had to go digital cause China. So same thing with this one is like, yeah. it wasn't even an option of like, Oh, what's my favorite cover. I'm like, Nope, I'm, I'm stuck with digital until I, till I get back and maybe I can find an old copy at that point. But, um, I was glad I was able to get You'll the Robin one. the uh, Scarecrow cover. Oh, I know that one was awesome. Yeah. Th this one I've gone digital for the time being. Uh, I, I really want the, uh, Michael Allred did a cover that is very like, reminiscent of the Batman 66 covers he did. Mm -hmm. I really want that one, but I think it was a retailer exclusive. So it's going for like 20, 25 bucks on eBay and everything. So it's kind of, uh, I'm in the, well, we just bought a house we uh -huh. have rented forever. So we just bought a house. I've been painting said house, which side note, I do not recommend that because painting a house is awful, but it <laughs> doesn't sound it makes it for looks, great martial arts training though. Oh, that is true. That is true. <laughs> uh, but it looks much better in here now. But anyway, so, I mean, I can't really, you know, you don't have disposable cash for buying a really, really sweet Michael Allred Detective 1027 cover as much as I want to. But yeah, I'm digital right now, too. So, yeah. So I'm with you. Know, I, I totally am with the cash strap thing, but I still bought every No, I didn't buy it. I don't ever fool with the retailer exclusives because that's just a rabbit hole I cannot go down. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I never do that. But as far as, like, the main DC direct distribution ones, I got every cover. I respect it. Do you have a, do you have a favorite one, Jamie? The Scarecrow one. I don't even know who drew that one, but it's so good. I need to look that one up because you guys yeah. keep mentioning it's it. Really, it's I really cool. It. Yeah. Well, I have a hard time reading the scribbles that they put on the front of, of the uh, – <laughs> book but yeah it, it's so faint i it's almost like a it's not quite black and white but it's, it's like a really muted color palette and batman is holding scarecrow by the throat like raised up in the air and there's like a side coming out of scarecrow's hand and there's a, a batarang wrapped around his wrist on a like a cable according it's, to it's a really great cover according to my good friend google uh that is gabriel del otto so, yeah, that is pretty cool. Yeah, it's really rad. I thought that was the Batman Begins uh, belt, like, at first glance, but I, it, it's it's different. But uh, it kind of looked similar to Bale's uh, belt. But, uh, yeah. Anyway. And, of anyway. course, the, the Jim Lee cover is my, my main thing. Like, lately, when they do these books, and I haven't been buying all the versions of it, the Jim Lee covers is the one I automatically default to. Yeah, he and that's his is like the one a, with uh, Superman. Is that that? Is that that one? Yes. Yeah, I like that. And one. honestly, I as much as I love Jim Lee, I, I I'll even admit it out loud. I don't think it's his best work, but I still like the cover. I I hate to say this, but I feel like we're get poor Jim because he's getting older. You're starting to see it in his artwork. It's not I as crisp it's as it used time. to be. It could be that too. It oh, could yeah. be, or it could be both. I, but like, I, I honestly think he's he's so busy doing so many other things that it's like when he commissions himself to do it, it's like he does it in, you know, I I don't know how long it takes these guys. I don't know if it's an hour project or a day project or what it is, but it feels to me like he's not putting his best effort in, and it could be the age catching up to him. I don't know, but. Well, because you, you see it in artists. Like, you see the art change as they get older. Because guess what? Their hands aren't as young as they used to be. Yeah. And I, I you know, you, you definitely saw it with, like, Frank Miller. Like, what, you know, how he yeah. drew in his prime and then how he draws now. Like, yeah, it's, it's just, it's they're not the same hands. Um, but I feel like, you know, you see it, you, you, see, you see it with Neil Adams when he still does stuff. It still looks great. It's just different. And I'm st I see that with Jim Lee a little bit of, like, it's not hush Jim Lee because his hands are 20 years older. 
I, I will say of the like the, the let's say the three action 1000 detective 1000 and detective 1027 uh, I, I like this Jim Lee cover the most um, I really I mean that's the cover that I got for action 1000 but that wasn't my favorite cover there uh, for detective 1000 I don't even remember who drew it but I got like the 50s variant that had all like the really weird Batman's Batman, you know, whatever you want to say, the plural of Batman is. Uh, that's the one I got. Um, it, but I, I mean, for this one, actually, it's I think what is it, Andy Kubert or Adam yeah. Kubert? I, can never I think remember. it's Andy. It's I, Andy, and he's he was is. he was always like in my comic book artist pantheon. It was always Jim Lee number one, Andy Kubert number two. So I love that he did the wraparound cover for this one. Yeah, it's great too. I love that main cover. It's amazing. Yeah, it was. It's funny because, yeah, like if it wasn't the main cover, if you would still put them all out in front of me, I probably would have picked that one as my favorite because yeah. it's it's great. What, what about the mega sweet uh, blank variant? Oh, man, those. <laughs> that one's mine. Well, I mean, yeah. right, at least I'll, I'll credit them in one department and that the other blank variants have all been white. And this one was like a sky blue. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I mean, at least it has that going for it, I yeah. guess. And you, can you know, draw, sucker you can... that I am, I always buy the blank variant too. They're like, <laughs> I'm, they're like, which covers do you want? I'm like, all of them. They're like, you even want the blank one? I said, hell yes, I want the blank one. All <laughs> of them. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, but then you can doodle your own cover. So yeah, you know, there, there you go. Sweet. Yeah, because that's what I, my collector's <laughs> mentality will really allow me to draw on a book. It's a Says Jamie Drewley exclusive. <laughs> I, I have some of those oversized comics from back in the day that Marvel used to do, and I have one for The Empire Strikes Back, and I opened it up like when we were packing stuff up to move or unpacking after we moved, and like I colored all through that thing. I'm like, you freaking five-year-old idiot. <laughs> no, the, these are all great. There are a couple that are like modern spins on the classic Detective 10 to, or the detective 27 cover of, you know, yes. with, with Batman swinging and he's got the, the crook under his arm. Uh, there's a couple of variations of that one where they replace the crook with the Joker one where it's just another crook. Those are really cool. Like I love, I love that stuff too, where it's like, Oh, you know, pay paying homage to the, the classic issue, which some of the stories do too, which I thought was great. Yeah. Cool. Well, That's yeah, I have to say <laughs> for, for, for now, I just have it digitally, which means I have the main cover, but I will make a complaint. Here's my complaint is I love that it's this really great wraparound cover that includes Alfred and Robin and, but the digital version, it has those two pieces, like it has the wraparound cut into two pieces of art. They don't have a digital of the whole complete picture. And I'm like, why wouldn't you put that in there? Cause that would be like a perfect wallpaper if you just put it in there. So now I have to search online, like do a Google image search and find it in high res where it should have just been in here digitally. And honestly, I wish they would have, they would have included a collection of the, uh, of the other cover art digitally too. Cause I go through yeah. and I, I screenshot my favorite art and keep it for like wallpapers and stuff. Um, so yeah, it would have been great if the digital version included a lot of those var variants, but they don't. Yeah. And there's not a lot of pinups in here either. Like, I was kind of surprised about that. So, I mean, it may be because they were pushing, what, 140 pages of content. So mm -hmm. maybe they just wanted to, you know, keep it under a certain page count. But, yeah, kind of surprised at the lack of uh, the uh, pinup art that's throughout. But, yeah, I mean, a variant cover gallery would have been really cool, too. Right? But they'll, yeah. probably release, they'll probably release Detective Comics 1027 deluxe edition in like four months and it'll all be in there. So yeah, that is true. So and I'll buy the digital again. version did have the, I mean, there's only, I think you're right. I think there's like four of the, the pinup art things in there. So the digital version did have those. Yes. Those are in here. Yeah. Because my favorite piece of artwork throughout any of this, you know, excluding some of these covers that we've discussed is the, the Lieber Mayo insert. Oh, the, uh, of the know, his, old his cereals? Art's always great. He puts so much detail in it, but, huh? Of the old cereals? Like the one that was inspired by the old cereals? Yeah, yeah. With that's Robin and that. It's, it's like a throwback to the That's awesome. That yeah, that's really cool. Robin's janky party city mask? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, well. Just yeah. get a shot of the red convertible out on the street behind him, you know? That'd be beautiful. 
such a shame. Oh well. Ah well. All right. Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> let's let's share our overall thoughts on this, and then we'll get into the specific stories. So Jay, yeah, uh, you've read it. What do you think? Uh, I I liked it. I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I honestly feel like Detective Comics One Thousand was almost like like this is them taking a mulligan because I didn't necessarily hate Detective One Thousand. It's just there weren't any stories in there that I absolutely adored. And there were even a few stories in there that I kind of disliked, you know, quite a bit, but, uh, you know, even the ones I liked in there, I still just kind of, you know, maybe in the B B plus range, like nothing that was really, uh, you know, stood out to me as a truly great Batman story. Mm-hmm. But, um, uh, even, uh, you know, I read it, uh, you know, a couple weeks ago, uh, 1027 here, I read it a couple weeks ago when it came out. Uh, and then, you know, I, uh, didn't do a deep dive read through, but I skimmed through it, you know, a bunch of the stories and everything, uh, earlier. And, uh, my opinion on some of them has changed a little bit, uh, you know, just since the initial read, but, um, overall, I think this is a really, really strong collection of Batman stories, uh, to your point, Andy, there uh, most of them are great, just standalone, one and done stories. That even if they have ties to kind of a uh, you know a modern continuity story, it still stands well enough on its own that it doesn't detract from that story. Say for maybe one of them when we get to it, mm-hmm. um, but but even then, it's still good storytelling and uh, like you said, a great. Uh, selection of creators uh and a unique combination of creators like you have guys that uh you know you always hear their names thrown out you know as big comic book greats but not necessarily working together uh so it's cool getting some of those interesting team ups like uh you know scott snyder and ivan reese you know you see ivan reese doing a lot of stuff and you see scott snyder doing a bunch of stuff but you don't ever really see scott snyder and Ivan Reese doing stuff together. So, you know, it's kind of cool that, you know, it's just a, just a little bit different, uh, di- different team ups here. Yeah. So absolutely. yeah, over, overall, I enjoyed it quite a bit. Wonderful. What about you, Jamie? Well, I hate to be the one that brings the party down here, but, uh, pretty much everything that Jay said in the comparison between, uh, detective 1000 and detective 1027, I copy and paste what he said, but, in the exact opposite fashion. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so Detective Detective 1000 was the mulligan, and Detective 1027 was I it. just... I, I read it today. I've been saving it up. You know, it's been on the top of my stack for, you know, about a week, because that's about how long we've been planning on doing this episode, just, just over a week now. And uh, saved it for today, because it's such a thick book, I didn't want to read it twice. So I just made sure I read it, you know, before we got on here to record. And... Uh, First and foremost, I want to say about half of these stories, the artwork was so bananas that it distracted me just in reading. Mm-hmm. Like it just like John Romita. I've never been like a, a, a mega fan of John Romita Jr. Like I've seen stuff from him that I liked, you know, like his his cover for Batman number one in, in Rebirth was was fantastic. It's still one of my favorite pieces of art in the Rebirth era. But, like, his stuff in here, I mean, he, you know, he, he likes to put the, the tiger stripe shading lines on his his stuff, and, like, I, I think he went, like, bonzo overboard with that in his art. But anyway, that's beside the point. Uh, there were a couple of stories in here that I really liked and I, I thought were really good, but for the most part, I thought it was lackluster, and there's even a couple that I just kind of finished up and was scratching my head going, Huh? So, I don't know. Maybe it's just a, a difference in the focus or familiarity with stuff. Interesting. Um, I, I I liked it. I didn't love most of it. Okay. I feel, I mean, I feel like I say the same thing for all of these. They're all, I think, a mixed bag, you know? I feel like there are always some highlights, then there are always some WTFs, and then there's some that are in between that you're kind of like, okay, that was all right, you know? Um I feel like when this one started, as I was reading it, because I only read it the once too, so it'll be interesting to see like as it changes as I revisit it. But um, like Jamie said, it's enough homework that I read it last night before before we did this. And 
when it started, I was like, oh man, like this one's really good. And then, and then it started getting a little more mixed. Um, I think my least favorites were the ones that just felt like teases to other stories where you're like, come on, like Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, like I get doing it for one of them, but why did we get two of them? Uh, but all the standalone stories I all thought were pretty good. Um, I certainly have my preferences and we'll talk about those, but you know, I, I feel this way usually how I feel about all of them, which is, yeah, there were some really cool highlights. I don't regret it. I like it. It's fun to see, to your point, Jay, these different combinations of creatives doing their thing. Um, and then, yeah, w- which stories work best for you or, or sort of in the eyes of the beholder. But yeah, I enjoyed it. I liked it. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about the book itself. Where are you, Mr. Book? Here we go. So, uh, as you said, it's a 144 page spectacular. Um, and I think that $10 for 10 bucks. I like how he read that in the Thurston Howell voice. 144 page spectacular spectacular. (laughs) Um, so it looks like there are 12 stories in 144 pages so and then a a number of pinups uh so cool let's go through them one by one as we usually do when we do these things so yeah i'll just i mean yes there's gonna be spoilers guys if you haven't read it you know you might want to pause and go check it out it's still worth your time it's a historic thing and and there's some good stuff in here um but we'll go them one by one and just kind of share what did we think uh the first one is called blowback this one uh was written by peter tomasi artist is brad walker uh inker andrew hennessy colorist nathan fairbairn and letterer Mm -hmm. rob lee uh, so this one has Batman like trapped underwater, uh, trying to figure out how to escape. And the way he figures out how to escape is he sort of goes through his past and all the different things he's learned fighting all the different villains in his rogues gallery. And he kind of goes through them one by one, Joker, Penguin, Catwoman, Riddler, Two-Face, etc. And you get most of the main rogues gallery and and what he has taken from all those encounters, each one of those making him smarter. Um, and that gives him the best idea, which is that he, he basically knows how to slower his life functions to appear dead. And when he does, it, it unleashes, or not unleashes, it, it, uh, it sort of shuts down whatever this death trap is, which allows him to escape and then take out this guy who did it, um, who I don't really know who this guy is. I think it's just some some random rando guy. Yeah, okay, that's what just I thought. To... That's what I thought. It's just like some some random guy. Um, but yeah, uh, Jay, what'd you think of this one? Uh, it was good. I really enjoy, uh, I mean, pretty much anything uh, Peter Tomasi does. Um, uh, his detective comics, uh, right now even, is at least consistently solid. Um, it's had a couple of slight dips, but uh, had some really high highs, too. Um, I loved his Batman and Robin, you know, back in the New 52. I uh, loved his uh, uh, Superman with Patrick Gleason And... Uh, you know, pretty much a fan of his, anything of his going into it. Uh, I thought this was a, a pretty cool, uh, just kind of rundown of uh, uh, Batman, uh, his, you know, his motives and skills and everything. And also uh, just a fun little rundown of all the, all of his villains, but also different Batman stories too, and time periods because mm-hmm. you have references to the Dark Knight Returns. You have mm-hmm. references to, you know, the New Fifty Two. You have references to, uh, you know, like comics from like the nineties, uh, like that era, and um, all sorts of stuff. So um, uh, Brad Walker gets to you know play around with his style and uh, uh, some of the character designs and everything. And even Clayface kind of looks like animated series Clayface, which is really cool. Yeah. Um, the uh, uh, it, it's it's one of those stories that's just kind of, uh, you know, just just fun, just fun to read. Just a nice little uh, just example of what Batman in his world uh, is and can be. Um, it's not anything, you know, earth shatteringly amazing. Uh, but I mean, like I said about most of Tomasi's detective run now, especially uh, it's just really solid, just really good Batman comics to me. Nice. Jamie, what about you? 
Yeah, T- Tomasi's a solid guy. He he he's a top tier guy working in the in the industry today, and I appreciate way more of his stuff than I don't. You know, it, it's a a short. You know, most of these are you know short summary kind of things. Uh, most of what stands out here for me, uh, you know, the the writing's good. The story is is decent enough. I mean, it's not like amazing. I'm not going to like wake up tomorrow and go, gosh, I need to read that again because it was so good. Uh, but other than the uh, the Dark Knight Returns reference that, that Jay mentioned, it's just one panel on the Joker page there with the little flying robot baby that had the foul mouth from the, the <laughs> Dark Knight Returns. I, I don't know why that just tickled my funny bone seeing that. Mm-hmm. Just not something you see referenced often. It's because the Dark Knight Returns is your love language, Jamie. We, you know, <laughs> I think you're right. I think you're right. But uh, the the main things that I wanted to call out for this story are Joker and Penguin both have really good renditions that feel classic, but they're still like super evil, creepy looking. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, Brad Walker's not an artist that I'm readily familiar with. I'm sure I've seen his work before, but like I... I it's just not a name that, that resonates with me. But his rendition of Catwoman at the bottom of that page where she's kind of doing the, the superhero landing pose thing, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that's the best-looking Catwoman I've seen that wasn't drawn by Joel Jones. Mm-hmm. I was about to say, that is pretty much a copy-paste, in a, in a good way, of Joel Jones's style from uh, her Catwoman book. I, I love her art, and I actually was like, really into her Catwoman book that she was she was writing and drawing that book for a while but then she stopped drawing it and I kind of lost interest yeah but yeah it's it's great yeah I I agree I mean I loved this one because I love Batman and Robin but I also love the rogues gallery so I love that this is a story that showcases all of the rogues not all all but I mean all the heavy hitters I was surprised how the, the how, major how far they went there. yeah which I, I loved um and I just I loved the idea of like that every victory against one of these guys has made him smarter and stronger and more capable. And I love that, like in a moment of panic, that's what he goes back to. Of like, what what have I learned? Um, and then you're right. Like, I think all of the versions of the of the the villains here, they all look really cool. You know, like I, I love that. I love the nods to the different eras, the different costumes. So like the Catwoman one. Yes, she's in the current costume, but she's also in. Uh, like the nineties purple one, but also she's in like the seventies purple and green one. Like, I love that there's all of that. Um, you mentioned the dark Knight returns nod. There's also a nod to Batman returns with, uh, there's a panel of Batman with all of the, the penguins with the, the rocket packs and stuff from the end of Batman returns. So, Oh my gosh. How did I even overlook that? (laughs) I, I, it got by me too. I didn't notice it until he just mentioned it and I flipped the page back and sure enough, there it is. Um, but you're right. I like, I love that they essentially boiled all the villains down to a quintessential version of them all. And they all look great. Um, no, I thought this one was awesome. And this is when I, when it started where I went, Oh man, that was great. Like we're off to a a smashing start. So I really liked it. Uh, The, uh, the ending, I just wanted to mention, uh, have either of you seen the taking of Pelham one, two, three? I have, but it's been a long time. Yeah. Well, I haven't seen the movie, but um, I think it was actually Tomasi like several months ago on Twitter uh, shared um, like the, the very final scene from the movie, uh, the se- the one made in the 70s, not the one with, uh, oh gosh, was it Denzel, was it Denzel right? in that one? Yeah. yeah, Denzel was in that one. Um, the original, I guess a plot point in the movie is like the guy who orchestrated everything like had a cold or something. Um, so uh, he almost gets away at the end, and then Walter Matthau's character leaves the guy's apartment, and um, the, he can hear the guy sneeze, so then he just opens the door again and kind of glares at him. And Tomasi shared this clip a couple months ago, um, and for whatever reason, like when I was reading this, you know, the, the ending here stuck out where this mm, guy, you know, sneezes, yeah. Batman sneaks up and Batman just says, Gesundheit. Um, I actually tweeted at Tomasi earlier today to ask him if that was a nod to it. And he said it was, so there you awesome. go. Uh, 
it's funny because our, our, our pal Robert Reinecke, he read this a couple days ago and he was like sharing his thoughts, but I hadn't read it yet. So I was like, I don't know what you're talking about yet, Robert. But he said, <laughs> he even said something like that of like, oh, I love the nod to the taking of Pelham one, two, three. And I went, okay. <laughs> you know, and and even, I, I still didn't get it because I don't know the movie that well. So, but that's cool. Um, yeah. All right. The next one, uh, this one, there is a dead cop. And Robin finds the dead cop. And then one by one, the Bat family all shows up at this site uh, around this dead cop. And eventually, Batman joins them. And uh, he's like, all right, guys, you know, what What happened here? You know, y'all, y'all have worked with me. I've taught you some detective skills. What can you learn? And so together, as a family, they solve the mystery of this, of this cop, uh, how he died, what he was after. Uh, turns out he was trying to, like, blackmail and and to to arrest his ex-wife because they were involved in some murder his ex-wife is now with killer croc so as a family they take down killer croc and they solve this mystery and batman says you know what guys you're you're a fine bunch of detectives each and every one of you and away he goes so uh this one sorry what was the name of it uh the master class Uh, written by Brian Michael Bendis, art by David Marquez, colors by Alejandro Sanchez, and letters by Josh Reed. So, Jay, thoughts on the masterclass? So this is one that I honestly thought started a little weak, uh, with the dialogue, at least. Um, Bendis, since he came to D.C., has been uh, kind of uh, hot and cold with me, I guess. Um, I really liked his Batman universe just because it was wacky, crazy weirdness. Um, I've not loved a lot of the stuff he's done with Superman, Young Justice, Legion of Superheroes, anything uh, really. Uh, Wasn't even really a fan of his story in Detective 1000. Um, I just felt like starting off here, the dialogue was maybe a little too cutesy. Um, like with, uh, uh, you know, I, I love seeing the Bat family interact, which is uh, what uh, made me enjoy this story more than anything, was just having the Bat family work together, interact together, and not be, you know, complete jerks to one another. Uh, that's always refreshing to see. Um, it, it, it's, it's a little, you know, uh, uh, cute and on the nose with everyone, you know, kind of swinging in. And then someone's like, oh, Nightwing, you know, is this body yours? And then, you know, Batgirl, is this one of yours? And, you know, it just, it, it, was, it was a little cute. But then once they actually get into the mystery and everyone starts working together and trying to piece together what happened with this guy, um, and then the resolution with Killer Croc, which uh, I thought was actually reminded me of a Batman Adventures uh, comic, you know, like the ones that Brendan's always talking about, uh, the ones that, uh, you know, kind of yeah. tie into the animated series. You mean uh, the, the only comics Brendan reads? Yes. Yes. <laughs> the very same. Uh, but no, there's a, there's an issue of um, like one of those. I can't remember which series it was because there were like five of them. Uh, but there's one where Killer Croc actually falls in love with Summer Gleason, um, you know, the the reporter from Gotham Tonight or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was really sweet and heartbreaking because, you know, he was trying to go straight, you know, find, you know, uh, find you know, love from somebody who could love him for him and everything. But, you know, in the end, he was still a monster. So there was that same kind of thing here at the end that made Croc the, even though Croc was kind of the, uh, the Batman villain of the piece, he was still more sympathetic than the actual villains, which were uh, the cop, dead cop and his ex-wife. Yeah. Um, Cause so- Croc didn't actually, it seems like he didn't actually do it. He just was trying to protect this woman that he ended up with. Yeah, but but he would even he kind of got uh, uh, got fooled by her and everything. So, um, I mean, it started off a little shaky, but then once it actually got into the actual mystery and everyone working together, uh, I actually ended up enjoying it quite a bit. Uh, and David Marquez. Oh, my gosh. Uh, he is quickly becoming like one of my favorite artists like he just his like anatomy with all the characters, like making them look different not just in their body types like uh you know jason's a little bit stockier than dick 
and uh, Tim is a little bit leaner than uh, Dick and, you know, shorter than him and everything. And Stephanie and Barbara both look like, you know, two completely different women, you know, not just a copy and paste, you know, the same female figure and everything um like his anatomy with the characters is great his layouts are fantastic uh he is just a fantastic comic artist and mm. i love everything that i see from him i'm glad with you said that because i completely range looking okay. legs in a couple of these panels i tend to agree with you there oh like nightwing's leg in that first appearance that he shows up in that's that leg is doing I, I don't know what it's doing. Oh, I, I mean, see. He's what, an acrobat. Yeah, so, I, I so see what can, you're saying, but uh, yeah, it didn't even bother me because yeah, he's he's always he's, he's agile he's and doing his thing. Yeah. Well, but, first of all, if he if he straightened his other leg out, it would only come down to like the top of his calf of that leg that's extended. Okay, so yeah, but that, it is that's a being little... overly critical. I mean, artists have stylized things. You know, uh, I knew a guy that hated Todd McFarlane's art because he's like, look at that cape. There's no way anybody could ever do anything with a cape that big. And, you know, like he hated the way he drew Venom. It's like, oh, okay. Yeah, whatever. but it looks cool, dude. Yeah, Come exactly. On. It's comics. It's <laughs> comics. No, I, we I want it to look I, cool. Right. I generally agree with you. Uh, artwork wise, I think my favorite thing is actually the shadow of the Batwing up on the moon when Batman shows up. I just think that looks cool. Yeah. I don't know why. Uh, that. Oh, man. Yeah. Again, I didn't even necessarily notice that. But yeah, that's really cool. And it's the animated series Batwing, too. Mm hmm. I, I'm not sure that uh, story-wise I buy the coincidence of these seven people showing up at this one spot at that one time. I, I don't know. Yeah, like I said, it's cutesy and convenient and kind of contrived, but I felt it got better as it went along. I, I, I do definitely agree with that. I, I like the that everybody's contributing their own measure of detective work and you know, in a couple of cases, especially in Red Hood's case, some paranoia <laughs> involved. It's like, we're in the middle of a kill box here, people. Uh, so I, I, I thought it was a, a decent story. I, I like the artwork. I, you know, I, I can be critical of things, I know, and I, I don't want to be because generally I think it looks great. And I, the, my favorite thing about this is having the family together and interacting and everybody's making a contribution to it. Nobody's yes. being shortchanged here. And mm -hmm. I, that, that's what I appreciated the most about this story. Yeah, well... I loved this one. It was awesome. I, I agree with you about uh, David Marquez's artwork. I was blown away by it. I was like, God, this looks amazing. Like everyone looks great in this. Um, I loved the intros. Like as each one swung in and you got the, the intro with their logo or their, you know, their stylized fonts and everything. I, I thought that was so cool. That's such a comic book thing. Um, I loved it. And I love that. Yeah. I mean, it, it includes, you know, so you got Robin, Nightwing, Batgirl, Red Robin, spoiler, Red Hood. Um, and the fact that it's it's a detective story and Batman is there kind of guiding them along. I thought this one was awesome. I liked the mystery it was truly a mystery. It was amazing how much mystery they packed into this short amount. Um, and I loved that as soon as they got there, Tim was like, yeah, it's Killer Croc. <laughs> and they're like, what are you talking about? And he goes, I can smell Killer Croc. He was here. And sure enough, he, when he pops up, they're like, oh, damn, Tim, you were right. It, it really was Killer Croc. <laughs> um, but yeah, the artwork of all of them fighting Croc at once is so cool. Um, yeah, I thought this was awesome. I mean, I'm a sucker for the Bat family anyway. Uh, to Jamie's point, like whoever your favorite is, they're, they're here and they're given their proper due. And I love that they're acting like a family and even, you know, Batman gives them that, that nod at the end of like, you guys, you know, you guys are awesome. You're, you, you learned, uh, you're a fine bunch of detectives. Oh, so no, I thought this was great. Yeah. Everyone's contribution was valued and welcome. That's what I liked about yeah. it was, you know, Batman wasn't there to tell everybody why they were wrong in this mystery. He was there to help everyone else, you know, figure out what was going on. I, I loved the, I love the teamwork here. Yeah, totally. I'd like, I would read this as a book monthly. So very cool. Well, you, you technically had that when Tynum was on detective. But. Well, we had a version of it. Yeah. I miss it. All right. Let's see. Next one up. I hate when they put the credits at the end. Cause I have to, here we go. All right. So this one is called many happy returns written by Matt fraction art and colors by chip. Zadarsky and letters by Aditya Bidikar. Um, so this one 
is kind of, uh, it's Batman telling us sort of like throughout all of the years of his relationship with the Joker, the Joker kept every year delivering him a birthday gift, but it was never on his birthday, but he always knew it was coming. Uh, and so he was always prepared for it, except this year, the birthday gift has not come yet. Uh, and so he's starting to get worried because he's like, there's no time left and this, this hasn't come. I know that he's up to something. What's he up to? Um, and finally the birthday gift is just him. He shows up himself to say happy birthday. And he says, I'm the gift. Um, and then he basically says, we're going to do this forever. And that is how it ends on Batman's birthday. Um, so, Jay, what do you think of this one? This one's weird because I love the concept. I love a lot of the individual, you know, panels uh, because Zdarsky goes to town here. Mm -hmm. I mean, he throws in so many uh, you know, jokes and gags and references and I'm more familiar with him as a writer. Uh, like I love, love, love his daredevil, uh, right now. I mean, that's, it's one of my favorite like comics on the stance period. Is he is, still writing uh, that? Yes. And it's, it's phenomenal. Um, I've, uh, and I mean, he's not a bad artist. It's just anything that he's drawn before. I've just never, I uh, just never happened to read. Um, and I like his style. It's, um, uh, it's definitely, you know, more of a, uh, simple kind of clean lines. He uses a lot of heavy inks. So there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, blacks, uh, throughout here. Like even on that one page with Superman, uh, all you can really make out is his, you know, red cape and the S shield. Mm -hmm. Um, so he, he inks pretty heavily, which isn't bad. It's just uh, kind of unique, but, um, uh, in the, and even the concept is, um, is, uh, you know, pretty cool, you know, uh, Batman and the Joker, uh, ca kind of like, uh, Tomasi's was an all in one. Hey, here's what you need to know about Batman and his rogues. Uh, this is almost an all in one, what you need to know about Batman and the Joker's relationship. Um, just it, something about it just didn't quite click with me. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it was. I loved mm -hmm. it visually. I love the concept. I think it might just be, I, I don't know, um, it, 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 having to separate what I expected versus what I got because um, I've uh, the main thing I've read from Matt Fraction was Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen, which, again, is a work of art. I loved that comic book so much because it was so silly, yet it was still like respectful to Jimmy Olsen, Superman comic books in general, but still being goofy and weird at the same time. Uh, and it just struck that perfect balance and it just was an incredible book. So having this be an almost like, I don't know, dour, I, I don't know if nihilistic is the right word, uh, but I mean, it's very, it's definitely like fatalist in Batman and Joker's relationship, which I get and I understand. It's just, I don't know, uh, some of the some of the visuals leading up to the um, uh, resolution. I won't say a punchline because it doesn't end on a joke. It actually ends kind of on a downer. Um, but the, uh, leading up to the resolution uh, almost made it feel like they switched where the story was going, like two thirds of the way through. And it still worked in a sense of kind of an overall broad picture of Batman and Joker's relationship, but it didn't quite work with what they were leading up to. Does that make sense? Oh, one. Yeah, totally. Uh, I, I mean, I'm right there with you actually. Cause I, like when it starts, it starts so promisingly and I'm like, Oh, what a cool idea. I love this. I lo it's a great way to give a lot of nods to Batman and Joker's relationship over the years, um, to pay a lot of homage to different eras and things like that. And there's some great Easter eggs in here. There are a couple Batman 89 references, including Prince. Yes. Yes. Which is awesome. That was great. Oh, I love that. Um, but yeah, like the resolution is just kind of a, huh? Like it just, yeah, it, it, it loses its way and then it doesn't stick the landing. So when it's over, you go, oh, um, okay. It's just weird. So. And I, and I, 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 I hate 
Joker knowing who Batman is. Not that I don't think he would know or should know, but I really honestly think that the Joker just would not care. Like, I don't think for their relationship, Joker knowing that Batman is Bruce Wayne even registers with him sure. because his, you know, his foil is Batman, mm-hmm. not Bruce Wayne. Yeah. So, I mean, just the fact that he, uh, he does that. Um, I do. Uh, you, you mentioned that Prince page and I went back there. I love that quote on the wall that every alley is a crime alley if you believe in yourself. And then it's attributed to the uh, penguin, but then it's attributed to the Joker. So it's like, the Joker is quoting himself, quoting the Penguin, saying that. Yeah. I thought that was a funny joke. Yeah. Uh, Jamie, where do you fall on this one? Uh, short, sweet, and to the point. Uh, I, I dig most of the artwork here. Uh, the one panel reference to, to Leto's Joker art-wise, uh, <laughs> I don't know if they did that because they like Leto's Joker or if they just wanted to see if they could get a rise out of the fanboy community, but uh, I, I liked seeing it. And uh, the story itself, felt like a whole lot of really good buildup and a whole lot of lacking in execution at the end. Yeah. I, I just, it, I, I wasn't crazy about it at all. Cause I, I, it, it felt like a buildup just like mm-hmm. you guys were saying it, 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 it felt like it was really going to go somewhere. And I ultimately don't think it went anywhere. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a story where Batman is shirtless and wrestling with a gorilla at the zoo while Joker is riding an elephant and it still doesn't stick the landing. And I, I don't know how you can do that and (laughs) not stick the landing for the story. (laughs) Yeah. Nope. I agree. I think we're all kind of uh, on the same page. Cause yeah, as it it is a very good buildup where you kind of go, Oh, 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 what's, you know, where are we going? And then when it ends, it's just kind of a, okay, sure. I kind of want to take a nap because you're so, sad yeah i can just want to go and curl up in a ball <laughs> all right let's see here moving on next one uh, where the heck is the darn credits here we go this one's rookie written by greg rucka artist eduardo risso and letters by tom Na- <laughs> this guy tom napolitano napolitano um so this one we follow the story of a new rookie in gotham who uh she goes to The police academy, there are no fun hijinks with Jones or Mahoney, so I'm already disappointed. (laughs) Um, But anyway, she goes to the police academy. She wants to make a difference. She realizes, I'm in Gotham, and and nobody, none of the cops here want to be a good cop. They're all, because they're in Gotham. They're, you know, they're taking advantage of being in Gotham, and she feels like she's the odd man out. She, uh... She's the only one who's trying to do it for the right reasons. And so she starts to doubt herself and like, maybe I should give in, you know, like everyone says I need to play ball. It's kind of like in Batman Begins, like, you know, you make us nervous if you're not playing ball. Um, And so she starts to lose her faith. And then she she realizes that there are still some good cops in Gotham. And uh, she uh, with Gordon and some of these other guys and they're like, you know what, you're a you're a good candidate for the major crimes unit and uh batman's just kind of watching over so she sort of joins gordon's crew uh where the good cops end up i guess um jay thoughts on this one uh i really liked this one uh i liked the fact that it was still definitely like about like batman's presence was there but he really wasn't in it you know save for you know a couple of shadowy panels and everything uh but it was still you could feel Batman actually um, uh, kind of presiding over everything, like in the atmosphere, everything. Uh, it reminded me a lot of uh, Gotham Central, mm-hmm. uh, which isn't surprising because I'm pretty sure Greg Rucker wrote that. <laughs> so um, uh, just uh, focusing more on the police in Gotham rather than Batman himself. Um, and I, I mean, I like the I like the mission statement, uh, the idea that. Um, you know, even even if, uh, you know, you're surrounded by corruption, if you still just, do, you know, do the right thing, um, you should do it because it's the right thing to do. And I, I like that uh, uh, this. Uh, what, what was her name? Uh, Baker was the rookie. last name. Lynn, name was Lynn. Rookie. <laughs> rookie. <laughs> rookie there. Rookie. Uh, Lynn uh, Baker is uh, uh, was her name, uh, at least on her entrance, you know, except acceptance paper thing whatever anyway um i like the fact that um 
she, uh, you know, she was the focus. Uh, it focused on um, so, just another person in Gotham. Uh, to me, that just makes Gotham City and Batman's world feel uh, like that much bigger. Um, like, I, I mean, as much as I love to see, you know, Batman throw down with, you know, Two-Face or the Riddler, or, you know, Poison Ivy or whomever, if that's like all the stories are, uh, you don't really necessarily get the stakes as much as if you see what's going on, you know, with just normal people going about their daily lives, living in this city that's, you know, on the verge of just complete and utter chaos and breakdown, save for, you know, one vigilante and a handful of good cops who are holding everything together. Um, so I just, I just really liked, uh, focusing on that aspect. Um, and honestly, uh, even though it's kind of uh, presented as a self-contained story, um, I mean, if we see this character pop up, you know, more in the future in, uh, regular Batman stories, I wouldn't complain because, you know, can always use, you know, more good cops and Batman stories, you know, besides just Commissioner Gordon. So, uh, uh, yeah, I really dug this. Uh, Eduardo Riso's uh, pencils and uh, uh, colors and everything, you know, they were uh, they were good. I mean, it was nothing outstanding or uh, uh, earth shattering there either. Um, again, it reminded me of Gotham Central, kind of had that same look and vibe uh, and it and it fit. It just wasn't everything I was over the moon about. But uh, I mean, overall, this is a really solid story and I really enjoyed it. All right, Jamie. Yeah, it, it definitely I it's been years since I've read Gotham Central. I think I have the first two volumes that I bought the, the collected editions and I enjoyed it. It, it looks, feels, everything about this just, it, it's right in line with that. Uh, I don't recall her being a character in there, but again, it's been years. Maybe she was, and this was like a, a, a prequel origin thing for her, I, or maybe this is just a random one-off. Uh, I, I dig this story. I, I think it's a good story. I think it's solid, and you know, I, I agree with you. It, it gives you the broader spectrum of Gotham, it lets you know that not all the cops are dirty. Gordon is not the only clean guy in the force. You know, it's there's there's other allies out there for for them to have in this this war on crime. Yeah. And, and I, I like seeing Batman vouch for somebody too. Um, right. You know, right. I mean, if, I I understand the whole grim, dark loner, you know, kind of everything. But you know, even even with his interactions with Gordon, you know, that's still kind of a stretch to say that he doesn't work with people at all. So seeing him, you know, say, hey, this is a good cop. Keep, you know, keep your eye on her. She has promise. It's just, you know, really cool to see that from him. I, I just almost would have liked a, a dialogue balloon from from Batman, like above them as they're Gordon and she as they're talking as he just like he could almost whisper it to himself more than to them and saying, now we're three, you know, something yeah. like that. <laughs> would have been great. But uh, just- my my criticism of this book, and this is a nitpicky criticism. You, you remember back in the day, and you don't get this very much at all anymore, where you just have a, a random issue in the continuity of the monthly book where it would be a one-off story. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now they all have to be like, you know, five to eight books, or in Tom King's case, 12, uh, <laughs> to, to tell a, a, a bigger arc. Versus, you know, getting those one-off stories that are in there. I would have loved to have seen a, you know, a 30-page, you know, one-off story in the main book about this. You know, fleshing out a little bit more of the detail and everything. And showing that there is another ally. And then even set it up for her to show back up at a later time to, to assist and help out. My criticism is, for a book that's supposed to be the celebration of the 1,000th appearance of Batman in Detective Comics... This seems a little not exactly in line with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I just yeah. feel this this story would have been better served as a as an offshoot in the main continuity book. It has Batman, but it's not directly about Batman. I, I, exactly. I, I, and again, that that's a Gotham Central thing. Batman shows up in like cameo appearances and in the shadows in Gotham Central, and it's you know. That's that. He's never like full blown involved in in anything because the stories are about the Gotham Police Force or that precinct or whatever. Right. I uh, I agree with that. So I I don't love this much as as you guys seem to uh, for that reason. Where like 
I love the idea of it, of like, oh, it's, you know, it's a rookie trying to be a good cop in a place like Gotham, and Gotham just keeps making it harder. But I guess I just, I would have liked, I don't expect Batman to, like, take her under his wing, but I, w- I, I would like more of it Batman observing her and realizing she's a good cop and kind of looking out for her in a way, because it just, it, he's just so incidental to the story that I just that moment at the end almost feels unearned where, you know, and, and it's also so subtle of like him essentially saying to Gordon, like, Hey, yeah, she's, she's a good one because they don't say that. They don't say anything. They just show a a silhouette of Batman talking to Gordon and then Gordon looking over. But like, if we knew Batman was watching her and realized, Oh, this, this one shows promise. This one's on our side. I just think it would have worked better. But like, that's not there the way I feel like it could have been. Um, so instead, I was just like, all right, you know, I'm, I'm reading this thing about this rookie and, and she's losing her faith. And then Gordon, Gordon's the one who's like, yep, yeah, great, join join my team. So, yeah, it was OK. I, I, I wish I loved it. I like the idea more than I like the execution. Sure. Yeah. And and yeah. And to, and to Jamie's point, it's like, yeah, what does this have to do with, you know, the the anniversary of Batman? And, and if they leaned more into Batman's relationship with the good cops, I think that would have been stronger. Sure. All I mean, right. I, I, I oh. totally get it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, moving forward, next one is Ghost Story, just in time for Halloween. Uh, written by James Tyne in the fourth, artist Riley Rosmo, colors Ivan Placentia, and letters by And World Design. Uh, so, uh, this one, uh, we get some flashbacks of young Bruce talking to his mom about ghosts, being afraid of ghosts. And in the present, Batman and Robin are working with dead man and dead man is, uh, is possessing Batman as needed. Cause they're taking out this, this ghost killer, bad guy, the specter collector. And they said, yeah, his name is dumb, but he is dangerous because he is dangerous to ghosts. And so, um, dead man uses Batman to help defeat this guy. And uh, we also learn, like, what Martha Wayne thought ghosts were. Like, they're a good ghost, they're a bad ghost, and those ghosts are the memories of the people and things that happen to you. Some of them are good and, ha- uh, and you know, help you, and some are, are bad, and they, they can haunt you, and that's what that is. But after Dead Man, Batman and Robin defeat this guy, Dead Man says, hey, like, do you want me to check in on your parents for you as a thank you? Uh, and... Batman goes, nope, I'm good. I already know. Uh, so away they go. That is Ghost Story. What do you think, Jay? All right. Um, I'm going to have unpopular opinion time here <laughs> um, as kind of a preamble set up here. Uh, with James Tynan IV, I'm uh, like, like I was with Bendis, kind of hot and cold on him since he's come to D.C., uh, I'm even more so with Tynan. Um, I loved his first and third Batman Ninja Turtles books. Um, I loved the uh, the first arc of his detective run. Um, and then even in like the Robin anniversary, or sorry, not the Robin, the uh, in Detective 1000, his story was actually my favorite. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just loved his focus on Robin and uh, and Batman and, uh, you know, the importance of, you know, Robin in uh, the dynamic duo. Uh, anything else, I just generally not a huge fan of him, uh, his writing and everything. Uh, but... I still enjoyed this one just because it was so weird and Mm -hmm. silly. It was like that, that right balance of uh, trying to be heartfelt with uh, Bruce's memories with his mom, which I don't think that quite worked out as well as it could have. Uh, But the, you know, goofy, silly, uh, you know, uh, specter, you know, or whatever collector or whatever his name was, you know, just how silly that was. And the, um, uh, the appearance of Dead Man, who I, I just always like stories with Dead Man. Uh, maybe not about Dead Man, but, uh, you know, I like him as a supporting character. So seeing him show up is always fun. Uh, and then just, you know, the uh, the the goofy, 
uh, resolution where Batman gets those gauntlets with like the uh, the you know transcriptions on them or or whatever so that he can you know beat this guy and everything. It it was goofy, silly, fun, which I like to read. And uh, um, anyway, you know, from time to time. Uh, more often than not, frankly. Uh, so yeah, I thought this one was uh, generally a winner, despite a couple of hiccups uh, along the way. All right, Jamie. Um, I'll start with the positive. Uh, I I like the concept of explaining why Batman ain't afraid of no ghost. <laughs> and that's going to be where the positive stops, because the only thing I hated worse than this story was the friggin' artwork that went with it. <laughs> okay yeah i forgot to I, mention I, rosmo who uh, is um an acquired taste for to be sure <laughs> yeah like that type of artwork and i know it's not exactly the, the kind of thing but the exaggerated like caricature style and something like chew works okay because it's setting a tone there this just i i don't know it just it, it didn't work for me at all and i know art is a subjective thing and it just, for me, this this did not work as a story, and it did not work as as an aesthetic. The I am one of the staunchest defenders of James Tyne in the fourth you will ever see. I've loved so much of his work from Detective and Justice League Dark. Uh, his his current work in the in the main Batman book, I, I'm really digging a lot. Uh, this this is not one of his best efforts, in my opinion. So I, I just th- this is definitely on the bottom rung for me with this book. Um, I liked the story. I didn't quite love it, but I liked it because, yeah, I mean, I, I tend to like Tynan a lot. Um, this one is a little weird for him, I feel like. This one, I was a little surprised that it was him because this doesn't feel like it's in his wheelhouse. But um, I really, I mean, I really loved kind of the heartfelt moments between Bruce and his mom and how that informed Bruce in the present. I thought that was really cool. I liked that it was an older story where it was Bruce and Dick as Robin. So I liked that it was a throwback. Um, I agree that, yeah, that the artwork is, is super weird. Um, is Riley Rosmo a man or a woman? Uh, uh Riley Rosmo is a man. Is, okay. Cause Riley, when I don't know, I didn't want to assume, yeah, um, yeah, no, no. <laughs> but anyway, so, I mean, he's doing his thing and I respect that. Great. It's not necessarily to my tastes, but Hey, do your thing. Um, and I'm glad there's, you know, there's a place for it. But yeah, it's just not my favorite style of art. It's just a little too wacky. Uh, so yeah, this one I thought was was pretty good. I Again, I liked the story. Um, I appreciated how weird it was. I liked that it still ended in a heartfelt place. But yeah, the artwork isn't, isn't my thing. And it's not my favorite of Tynan's work. So it's kind of in the middle as far as I'm concerned. The one thing I did like was that when uh, when Dead Man possesses Batman, uh, and he's even more acrobatic than Batman because he was an acrobat. Right. I, I thought that was actually a nice touch that I you don't really think about as much. Where he's like, "Yeah, well, keep up if you can, kid." So yeah, I thought it was okay. Yeah. Oh, I think the thing, honestly, th- this just kind of clicked with me because I'm trying trying to figure out why. I mean. I don't love Riley Rosmo's style. It's a distinct, unique style, mm-hmm. and it works for him. I don't necessarily think it works for a lot of the stories they tap him for, because mm-hmm. um, he did a Batman and Shadow book a couple years ago, and it just did not fit at all. Mm. Like it just looked, it looked weird. It it just was not the right style. I think Is that the, the one fact, Orlando wrote. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, a book that I honestly kind of forgot existed until like right now. Uh, but um, <laughs> I think <laughs> I think what made it work for me and and I mean, this is just for me is Dead Man's Presence. Mm-hmm. Like I think like that kind of it's it's not the same aesthetic as like a Kelly Jones, but you can kind of see how he was sort of uh, inspired by him. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, like, can you see that, uh, you know, in his uh, in maybe his figures and everything, just kind of the globular muscles and everything and uh just the really exaggerated uh poses and everything like that i i I can definitely feel kelly jones's like you know presence in his style even if it's not a direct you know one-to-one imitation so having a more horror centric character like dead man i think is what made it go down a little bit easier for me at least Mm -hmm. like if dead man wasn't in this and it was just 
Batman and Robin, you know, doing like a Scooby Doo mystery in the present rather than, uh, you know, fighting actual ghosts. I don't think it would have worked at all. But having it actually be a supernatural element in there, I think that's why it worked for me at least. No, that makes sense. And reading this book, you know, just flipping back through the panels here, what what it looks like to me is that uh, Sam Keith dropped acid and tried to draw everyone as Plastic Man. <laughs> That's Which yeah. That's also sense. accurate. <laughs> 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 All right, moving forward, uh, we get a pinup by Jose Luis Garcia Lopez and Trish Mulvihill. Uh, it's pretty awesome. Uh, it's like a big looming Batman and his rogue sort of running uh, in the bottom frame. I really love that. So that got a screenshot from me when I read this. Uh, of course. Um, next story is four, written by Kelly Sue DeConnick. Pencils by John Romita Jr., inks by Klaus John- Jansen, colors by Arif Prianto, and letters by ALW's Troy Petiri. So uh, Bruce Wayne is playing golf with this SOB. I don't even remember his name, but anyway, basically this guy is trying to make a deal with Bruce. Bruce tells him to F off, and this guy's like, man, you're making a powerful enemy. This is bad news for you. You can't can't say no to me. You got to understand. And this is intercut with Bruce... Um, as Batman breaking in and uh, squeezing a bad guy about some corruption in the police department. Um, but during this golf game, uh, the guy's like, listen, listen, I own everybody. I own the city council. I own the cops. You, you need to work with me. Otherwise, you're going to regret it. Uh, and then we find out it was all a sting operation. The cops were listening. Um, and so the cops come in. They arrest this guy. Bruce takes him out by tossing a golf club. Uh, and we realized that, like, the intercut was Batman taking out the corrupt cops based on what he learned from this interaction. And that's four. So what do you think about this one, Jay? Uh, the story uh, I really liked. I liked seeing Bruce have something to do. Uh, like I was saying with the the rookie story earlier, uh, you know, I like it when you get uh, just other people in Gotham uh, kind of have the the focus every now and then, uh, not even necessarily as uh, the main character in a story, but, you know, having it be people outside of Batman and his immediate supporting cast. Uh, I, I like bringing in a little bit of that, but I also like it when Bruce Wayne actually has stuff to do. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the the goofy, you know, flighty playboy persona and everything is fun to read, but it's not always... Uh, uh, it's not always the best approach for Bruce to do a lot of things. Uh, I could definitely see, you know, Bruce doing something like this, you know, setting up a sting operation, pretending that he's terrible at golf just so he can get, you know, a rise out of this guy to, uh, uh, let Gordon and the, you know, the good cops take him down. Mm -hmm. Um, I really like that. I like the idea. Uh, I mean, like Jamie was saying earlier, uh, Ramita is not my favorite penciler. He never has been. I think this is some of his stronger work in recent memory, Um, like especially after like Superman year one and uh, a couple of other uh, uh, things he's done. Uh, The the plain clothes like Bruce and, you know, jerk that he's talking to. I don't remember his name either. Uh, That that stuff actually looks really good. I like the rain effects that he he goes for there. Uh, I think that's really affecting. or effective uh the action scenes with batman uh have some decent like movement and uh energy to them but there is like uh just some some really weird anatomy like uh when he's kind of you know backhanding that guy with his forearm and um his left leg looks like it's actually behind his right leg (laughs) Uh, you know, it's just kind of some wobbly, rubbery, uh, anatomy here and proportions. And, um, uh, uh, that's not my favorite, but, um, uh, again, it's one of those story ideas that I like, uh, and I generally like the execution of it. Uh, when he threw the golf club at the guy, that was, that was pretty baller. That's that pretty was rad. Pretty yeah. Cool. I like that. <laughs> that <is pretty> cool. <laughs> uh, uh, if, if you don't mind, I have a fun story about John Romita Jr. Okay. Um, 
it's it's a good one. It'll be quick. Uh, last year at Comic Con, which for all we know will be the last Comic Con ever, the way things are going, uh, I actually took a collection of some of his Marvel work, uh, like a Marvel Visionaries John Romita Jr. book, just to have him sign because uh, I was like, okay, that'd be that'd be really cool. Uh, he signed it and then he drew Iron Man in it for me without me even asking. Oh, so. Yeah, it's like Iron Man's not anywhere close to my favorite character, but if a comic book legend like John Romita Jr. wants to draw me Iron Man, then John Romita Jr. can draw me Iron Man for all right. I care. Right. Does uh, Iron Man look like he has a broken nose? Uh, well, considering Iron Man's faceplate is flat, uh, I suppose so. Romita yeah. would figure out a way, though. If anybody would figure out a way, he would figure out a way. Yeah. Uh, it was just his head, like his helmet and everything. So, um, yeah, uh, but. Overall, uh, story was good. Pencils, I mean, like Rosmo's work, uh, very stylized, very unique, uh, acquired taste. Uh, didn't hate them, but didn't love them either. Uh, so, I mean, this was one of the more middle of the road stories for me for that reason. All right, Jamie. Uh, I thought the story was decent enough. I, Deconic's the one that took over Aquaman, right? Yes. Okay, because Aquaman bit, went from being one of my top favorite three to five books every month in the Rebirth era to she took over the book, and within four months I canceled it because I couldn't stand it anymore. All right. So <laughs> she's not my favorite person based on that, but this story was, was reasonably decent. Uh, because I'm the smartest guy in the room, I figured out like three pages in, he's got to be wearing a wire. There's no other way that this could go down. <laughs> But, uh, you know, it, I, I don't know. I, I don't think there's anything to really write home about. There's nothing that's overly impressive here, artwork-wise or, or story-wise. But it, it was decent. Middle of the road. Yeah, that's, that's about where I'm at. Decent. Um, I like the idea of Bruce Wayne using his persona to essentially take down this guy from both angles. So, like... He lowers this guy's expectations of him because he's Bruce Wayne, gets this guy talking, and he can use that against him. And then at the same time, uses that info to inform what Batman's going to do. Um, so I think that's actually a really cool idea for the story. So yeah, I thought it was okay. Um, like I said, I think my favorite part was when he whipped that <laughs> that golf club at him and took him out. I thought that was pretty awesome. Um, and then yeah, as you as you guys said, like the the art is is a little weird. It's okay, but yeah, certainly not my favorite. So yeah, like. I'm with you guys, sort of middle of the road, but uh, solid. Good idea here. Um, all right, next uh, we got another pinup. This one's by Jamal Campbell. This one I loved as well. It got a screenshot. It's of Batman sparring with Nightwing in the Batcave while Alfred watches on. So what's with not to love? In his hand. <laughs> yeah, what's not to love about that? That's great. So this one's rad. Uh, next one up. Okay. A Andy just took a picture of it because of the giant T-Rex in the background. It doesn't hurt. <laughs> okay, next one is Odyssey. This one was written by Marv Wolfman and pencils by Emanuela Lupacino, inks by Bill Sinkowicz, colors by Jordi Belair, and uh, letters by Carlos Mangual. So this starts with like an old story of uh, Bruce's grandfather um, on this ship called the Odyssey, and then there's like a helicopter flying machine uh it manages to like crash into this ship this is something that happened a long time ago so we find out they've always been searching for this artwork uh that was on this ship they think they finally found it and so they're bringing uh, along this podcast <laughs> a podcasting crew uh to this dive to find this long lost artwork to sort of return it to its rightful owners we find out one of these podcasters uh is, a, is an imposter and is there to, to cause trouble, but it's all good. Bruce was ready for it. He knew. He's Batman. He takes this guy out, and uh, we realized that, yeah, the crash was a setup, and uh, the art had been stolen years, years before. Um, and so they're like, nope, we don't have it, but Bruce is like, don't worry. I still have, uh, still have some, some documents and some maps that will lead us to it, and away we go. So, yeah, this one is Odyssey, Jay. Uh, so earlier I said that most of the stories in here, you know, I felt were, you know, solid and I really enjoyed and everything. Uh, even 
after flipping through the book earlier, uh, I forgot about this one again because <laughs> I forgot about pretty much everything about it the first time. That's okay. I forgot um, about it until just now as I'm going through story by story. I was like, oh, yeah, crap, that one, the weird one about the, t- the Titanic. I forgot about that. I, yeah. It's a story that has a bunch of elements that should work really well, but I don't know. It's almost like this was a pitch for a mini series or, you know, a several issue arc or something. But then they just, you know, had to wrap it up in seven pages and it just it's just kind of rushed. I never really got a good idea of who was who with the scuba team. Mm -hmm. You know, they say one guy's, you know, uh, uh, an imposter, you know, he's he's just a thief and everything. But the action underwater and everything um, is drawn well. It's just I don't know who's supposed to be who yeah. and everything. Well, and, and especially I, they, I, they, they're like they're like, oh, they're, you know, uh, what do they say? They're they're descendants of like all these old detectives. But I'm like, I don't know who any of those people are. Yeah. And uh, I think I like remember the names from let, let me go back to. Uh, where it was. Uh, I could do that when, when Jamie's talking in a minute, because I think I recognized the names. But even then, that that was an aspect of the story I completely forgot about until you just mentioned it. Yeah. Um, th- I mean, this would be a fun story. Like, ooh, Batman going on an undersea treasure hunt. Batman and the flying hellfish is what this would be. Mm-hmm. You know, bring in, you know, Abe Simpson, and then we can go find this, uh. and, <laughs> you know, you know <laughs> Nazi treasure and everything. Um, and it's a good idea. And I mean, I don't hate anything about it, really. It's just it uh, it wasn't memorable at all. Mm-hmm. Like, like I said, it felt like a pitch that they uh, illustrated and then just stuck in here. Mm-hmm. And um, I wanted more of it, but it was also less of a, ooh, I need to have more of this story because it's so great. And more of a, I want more of this because the story doesn't feel like it's complete at all. Mm-hmm. Jamie, what about you? Listen, I dig Marv Wolfman. What Marv Wolfman is is a legend. Okay, this is if I didn't know Marv Wolfman wrote this story and somebody told me, I would not believe them, because I did not like this story at all. <laughs> not that I loved everything Marv Wolfman ever did that I've read of his, but more often than not, that's the case, I and mean, this is not the case here. I I was not. Not into this at all. It started off, and I was wondering, is this like some kind of a weird, you know, prequel mixed into the the Gotham by Gaslight continuity, or what? What's going on here? And then it just—I I don't know. I, I just—I I couldn't get into any of this at all. I am with you, Jamie, and it, it broke my heart to see that this was a Marv Wolfman story because I was like, what is this? Why am I like, what is, why is this in here? Why am I reading this? This is so weird. And yeah, I thought it was going to be something like somehow really playing off of Bruce's ancestors and like what they did. But like, that's more of a footnote to this thing. And when I saw the credits at the very end, I was like, oh, Marv, really? Like, oh, I don't want to say anything bad about Marv Wolfman. But yeah, this story, it didn't work for me. I wasn't interested. I don't need to see the extended cut. I'm good. Um, I just, yeah, it, it, like if if this was Batman teaming up with characters we knew or cared about, or if these characters were somehow better defined, maybe it would be more fun. But yeah, it just, for me, it just wasn't that interesting. I, I wasn't. I wasn't invested in it at all. And when it was over, I was like, okay, great. Moving on. Yeah. As, as far as the characters you were talking about, descendants of Gotham detectives, uh, there's Roy Raymond. I'm not sure who he's supposed to be descended from because there's like five characters with the last name Raymond. So I'm not, I'm not sure. Martin compass. No idea. Sandra Bradley. I'm going to guess is slam Bradley's, you know, daughter, granddaughter, and then there's Kathy Saunders. I'm going to guess uh, Kendra Saunders, who's, you know, one of the hot girls. So, you know, maybe that's it. But, I mean, even then, it was a non-point in the story. Like, that didn't play into anything at all mm-hmm. other than having vague name recognition. That's all it was. Yeah, and I assumed that was, like, an homage to some of the characters in Detective Comics before it became a Batman book. But Mm -hmm. I don't know those characters well enough to really know. So, yeah, Yeah. uh, on on the plus side, I did like the art in this. I thought the art was pretty strong. Um, I liked how Batman looked. But, yeah, the story, I just I couldn't get into it. Yeah. 
All right, moving forward, the next one is Detective Number 26. This one was written by Grant Morrison, artist by uh, Chris Burnham, uh, colors Nathan Fairbairn, and letters by Steve Wands. So this one is all about the Silver Ghost. So the Silver Ghost... Uh, this is a guy who uh, is out there. He's trying to be a detective. He's always dreamt of being a detective in Gotham. Uh, but problem is Gotham is just full of detectives and PIs, so it's hard to stand out. And so you start to see some of these detectives take on more romantic personas. And so he decides to suit, to do the same, uh, and he creates the persona of the Silver Ghost. And he's out there. He's ready to go. He's got the outfit. Uh, he's got the car he's got the guns he's gonna go out there and and fight bad guys and he goes because if who if i don't do it who will and as he's out there it seems like on his first mission uh before he can even uh jump in batman shows up and batman takes care of it so this dovetails into the story from detective comics number 27 so it's the the crime of the chemical syndicate um, we get some some new versions of, of what we see Batman do in that original Batman story. And it turns out the Silver Ghost was watching all along. And in the end, he's like, well, crap, I don't, I don't know what to do now because this <laughs> Batman guy's got it covered. So to hell with it. And he, he quits before he even begins. Um, Jay, thoughts on this one? Uh, yeah, this was great. It didn't overstay its welcome. It was, you know, clever and and funny. Uh, I love just the idea of seeing all these different, you know, 20s era, um, uh, really, really co colorful and uh, crazy detective uh, vigilantes out there. Pretty sure that's supposed to be the gray ghost there on looks that, like uh, one panel yeah. with all of them. And that kind of looks like the Green Hornet in the background, but that might just be, you know, a uh, um, coincidence. Uh, I, I just love the idea of this guy who is like, okay, these guys can't do it. Um, I'm going to go out there and do this. And then he is so disheartened by it that he sinks to the ground, says, shove it, Gotham, <laughs> and then just goes on with his life. Uh, it's short, it's sweet, um, it's fun, and not trying to be mind bendingly weird and crazy. Like a lot of Morrison is, uh, Great. it's just, <laughs> which I, I love that, but I also recognize that not everybody does. So having something that's, you know, just very much a clever lead in to detective 27, uh, was a lot of fun. I, I loved this one quite a bit. All right, Jamie. I, I got to this story and I turned the page and it, you know, detective number 26 there. I'm like, oh, all right, this is interesting. And then I saw it was written by Grant Morrison. I was like, oh, Lord, here we go. Because <laughs> I'm one of those people. Morrison is very hit and miss for me. And lately he's been way more missed than hit. Like I couldn't get past issue number three of his Green Lantern book. I just, I, Jay, I know you're really into that one. It, it ain't for me. I, I just, no, it, it's obscurity for the sake of obscurity, which I find Morrison just relishes in doing. Uh, I found this story to be a delight. I don't know that I would consider it like a massive Batman story or, you know, if I want to give the same critique here that I gave with the the rookie story where I say, does this really belong in a story celebrating the 1,000th the appearance, the appearance of Batman in this title? But I got a huge kick out of it, and I was giggling myself silly by the end of it. I This might be my favorite story in the whole book, actually. Oh, nice. So I... I totally, because it was Grant Morrison, I thought you were just going to dislike it for that reason, Jamie. Because <laughs> uh, I loved this. I loved it. Because when it started, I guess I should have known because it was called Detective Number 26. I didn't think of it. I was like, huh, okay. I'm like, let's see where he's going with this. I thought the design for the Silver Ghost is actually really rad. It's totally consistent mm -hmm. with what these characters looked like back then, but it's still I love unique the enough. Tommy guns. Oh That's man, he looks he's so awesome. Insane. He looks great. And he's even got the little ghost on his car. Like, I love it. Um so like I was like, huh, okay, interesting, interesting. And then as soon as he said something about um Chemical Mogul Old Lambert. I went, oh, I see what you're doing here. And then he pulls his car up and it's next to the old Batman red car before he got a Batmobile. 
I was like, oh, hell yeah, that's amazing. This was so <laughs> clever. And the fact that, yes, like he's about to go in and be the big hero and Batman beats him to it by moments. And it's, he's just like, oh, well, shit, what's the point? God, so fun, so clever. It was awesome. I love this. And I love the way it ties into Detective Comics number 27. Again, I love seeing moments of that story played from a different angle. Um, oh, man, no, this, this one was terrific. The art was really cool. It was actually perfect artwork for this sort of throwback story. Um Yep, I love this one. Well done, Grant Morrison. Like so clever, so cool, perfectly executed. I love it. Yeah, kind of, kind of like Batman's origin. I can could live a thousand years without ever hearing it again and be okay with it. Another take on, or okay, another retelling of Detective Comics number twenty-seven. I'm kind of done with, but this was a great way to kind of retell the story but in a in a different way you know because i mean it's from that different angle and um you know just seeing the effect it had on really if you want to think of it in like a meta textual sense you know batman was almost the end of those kind of pulp heroes even though he i mean he he was definitely inspired slash you know ripped off of them (laughs) you know let's let's be real here um he was definitely inspired by that, but he still, because of, you know, Batman and Superman and then Wonder Woman, Aquaman, Hawkman, all those characters that came out, you know, around that time, Batman was kind of the, the turning point for, um, you know, pulp heroes kind of fading away into outright superheroes. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm, and because it's Grant Morrison, I'm sure he meant that. (laughs) Right. Yep, I agree. I mean, I, I like when they do the spins on Detective Number 27 because I think it's, you know, it's classic, it's cool, but this was such a great way of doing it in a way we haven't seen before. Mm-hmm. It's awesome. Um, all right, next one up. Uh, this one is called Legacy. Written by Tom King. Art by Walter Simonson. Colors by Laura Martin. And letters by John Workman. And it says for Denny, which is really nice. So here um, we have a story with Batman fighting, oh my God, what's his name? Dr. Phosphorus, something like that? Yes. Is that right? Dr. Phosphorus? So yeah, Batman's fighting Dr. Phosphorus and Dr. Phosphorus is basically saying, hey, like, guess what? You're fighting me and by fighting me, it's going to kill you because it's going to give you cancer. And so no one else was able to do it and I'm going to do it and that way you will remember me when it's time to go. And uh, again, this is intercut with uh, old Bruce on his deathbed with Selina. Um, and at the end, like it kind of comes full circle, which is Batman's like, well, I think I can help you. There's, you know, there are these doctors who might be able to help me. He's like, wait, you know, I'm, I'm telling you I want to kill you and you're saying you want to help me. And Batman's like, yeah. I'll remember you because you killed me and you'll remember me because I saved your life. So that's our legacy. Hence the name legacy. So uh, it does seem like uh, Bruce dies in the future uh, because of this. It seems like this works. But at the same time, even though Dr. Phosphorus's big thing is I'm going to be the one that kills you, Batman still can't help himself. He still wants to help him. So that's legacy. Jay Yaws, what do you think? Um, this is another one that I kind of forgot about until I was flipping through it. Um, I don't know. I, I like the sentiment. I like the idea that even if, you know, a villain is hell bent on, you know, bringing Batman to an end, he's still going to try to save his life and help him reform. Mm -hmm. Uh, I like that. I like that idea. I like the you know the the uh, call out for dr phosphorus because he i I think he originated in like that strange apparitions storyline from uh marshall rogers and uh oh gosh it'll come to me later anyway from the 70s i really like that story this was one that i i mean i just kind of plum forgot about um and uh it's It's that abstract storytelling of Kings that works for some characters and not Batman, 
And I just appreciated the sentiment. I appreciated, you know, seeing uh, Walter Simonson, even if, uh, you know, uh, kind of like Ramita, you know, some of his uh, uh, better days uh, as an artist are uh, kind of behind him. And even someone like John Workman, who's been a letterer for decades. You know, it's kind of cool seeing those names. Uh, this really didn't do a lot for me. Um, like most of Tom King's run on Batman, too. So, uh, yeah, wasn't really a fan of this one. And I found it ultimately forgettable. Well, the only uh, writer that Jamie likes more than Grant Morrison is Tom King. So I'm really curious to hear his thoughts. Tom King is the most masturbatory, self-indulgent writer I've ever seen in my entire life. If he never writes another Batman story again, I'm okay with it. The, you know, Jay said he's tired of, the, of Batman's origin. The only thing I'm more tired of than Batman's origin is Tom King letting Batman die in his old age with Catwoman <laughs> sitting on the bed with him. How many times have we seen that now? Too many. That's the yes. End. That yeah. is the we, crux we, of his entire Batman run. We we can just go about our business now. Please be done with Tom King. Um, trade him to Marvel. Give me Don Cates. Everybody will be happy. <laughs> All right. Um. I agree. It's funny. The very first page before we got the credits, I see Bruce on his deathbed with Selena holding his hand, and I went, I bet this is Tom King. <laughs> because, like, that's the thing, is, like, he's used this trick before, and not just with Batman. He's done it with Superman. Like, he, it's like, yeah, we've already, you, you only get to play this card once, but you keep playing it every chance you get. Like, it doesn't mean as much if you keep showing us Batman die. Like, you only get to do it once. And so, like, when I saw that, I was like, ah, bleh. Great. Okay, you're you're, you're trying to uh, manipulate our emotions yet again by showing us our hero die. How revolutionary, Tom King. Great. Um, I like the idea of honestly, like I didn't need the death. Like I like the idea of this guy wanting to kill Batman and Batman wanting to save the guy. Like yeah. that could have and should have been the story. And then I'd gone, oh man, good job. But like Tom King can't help himself. He's like, oh no, man deathbed bros it's my thing and i'm just like whatever dude like so i thought the core idea of like batman not giving up on someone even as that someone was gloating about killing batman is actually really cool but because it was so overly dramatic and so self-indulgent like i feel like it lost its effect on me because i just went oh here he goes again yeah 100 percent. so yeah boo whatever dude I can't wait for the next anniversary issue where you show me Hal Jordan killing himself or something. Like, <laughs> all right. Uh, next one. Okay. Next one is called As Always. This one is uh, Scott Snyder. Uh, pencils by Ivan Reese. Inks by Joe Prado. Colors by Marcelo Maiolo. And letters by Tom Napolitano. Um, so this one, it's really taken from the perspective of Jim Gordon. So he's talking about like his relationship with Batman of like, you know, we, we, we like this bat symbol, not just to call Batman, but also to tell the people of Gotham that it's going to be okay, that the, the sun will rise tomorrow. Turns out that this night, the sun might not rise tomorrow. There's a problem literally with uh, our planet and the sun. So Batman disappears and uh, Jim, he just has to assume that Batman and the Justice League are going to take care of this. So this is very much almost a Justice League story where you see Batman uh, out there and they're literally dealing with like one of the biggest problems you could ever imagine of, of, of how do you save the entire planet. Um, and so you get a lot of flashes of Batman working with these superpower beings, with the Justice League, with Justice League Dark, with the Green Lantern Corps, um, and how they can actually save this. And Jim's like, I just hope that, you know, they've got a plan because I literally can't do anything about it. And as always, Batman shows up a couple days later and is like, you know what? Don't even worry about it. We got it handled. And the light, the bat symbol is, uh, bat signal is lit yet again to show that indeed tomorrow the sun will rise again. So, Jay Yaws, what'd you think? Uh, art was fantastic. 
like Ivan Reese is great. I loved seeing kind of just, you know, nods to all the, you know, craziness that the Justice League gets involved in, but that it was seen from Jim Gordon's perspective and that you kind of, it's one of those things that you don't always think about in the story, but it's like, you know, we're following the superheroes along with this as they're trying to prevent you know, the sun from imploding and, you know, taking out everything in the solar system or whatever, or the anti-monitor coming to, you know, destroy all of the multiverse or anything like that. You know, we're following the heroes, but then the people who are just kind of left at home, like, okay, we hope that the heroes, you know, win, but uh, what if they don't? And then they just have to sit there, you know, in anxiety and nervousness and fear and everything. Uh, so that was kind of an interesting uh, angle to take on it. Um, the the story itself was kind of a, uh, it, it was generally a, a fun, compressed, here's all the crazy stuff that goes on um, that we shouldn't ever come back from. And yet we do. And then, I, and the ending was nice that, you know, even, uh, even in, uh, the face of, you know, complete, you know, Armageddon for the, uh, for the entire world, for the entire universe, for everybody, uh, Batman still takes the time to focus on his city and show that, yes, he's still there to protect it. Um, I think that the final line would have actually worked better. Um, because the uh, the last page says, you know, and as always, he showed me. I feel like it would have worked better if they took out the as always there and then just let the title be the, you know, Jim saying as mm -hmm. always. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like that would have worked better. So, I mean, this was, I mean, I mean, very much um, Justice League, Scott Snyder, just doing all sorts of wacky, crazy things. And, uh, um, but from from another character who's celebrating a 1000 issue anniversary that we don't always think of because Jim Gordon premiered right alongside Batman and detective 27. So it's nice that Gordon got his own uh, focus here too. Yeah. Jamie. Uh, Scott Snyder is not my, my favorite. Uh, I do not care for his justice league stories in the least. Like some of his Batman stories are, are up and down for me, but like his justice league stuff I, just, I can't with that. I, I dropped that book because I couldn't take it anymore. And I knew that he had written this story because, you know, I, I looked at the, the interior panel there when you open up the cover that shows you who wrote what. So when I got to it, I thought, if I see the words source or wall anywhere <laughs> in the story, I don't give a damn if they're three pages apart. I'm going to open this second floor window where my reading nook is at, and I'm going to throw this in the backyard for the deer to eat tomorrow morning. Turns out... Right behind the Grant Morrison story, this is my favorite one in the whole book. Nice. Ah. <laughs> I really dug this one a lot because, I mean, it, it was concise. You know, the, the part of my problem with Scott Snyder is he can get a little wordy and he stretches things out a little longer than I think they need to go. And in this case, he was forced to do it in a very concise manner. And I think it worked out great for everybody, him, me, and all the other readers that, that happened to pick this book up. So, yeah, I mean, short, sweet, to the point, I... I I think this is the second best story in the whole book. Yeah, all right. Yeah, I, I really liked it too. I thought it was neat because what it was was it was a it was addressing the people who go, why is Batman part of the Justice League? You know, what what is Batman going to do when Superman, Wonder Woman, and the Flash are around? What, what what's what's for Batman to do? And I like that this was an answer to that question. And I like that it's a it's it's celebrating that element of the Batman story, you know, I mean, that's kind of the nice thing about all these different stories is, you know, the very first one, it was, it was really celebrating the rogues gallery. The second one was celebrating the bat family. We had the one celebrating the, the good cops in Gotham. And this is celebrating the aspect of, yeah, Batman's just a man, but he's still invaluable to these super powered beings. And he's still out there trying to save not just Gotham, but the entire planet. And I like that. That's what this one was saying. So yeah, I thought it was really neat. Um, <clears throat> You know, and as you said, the art is great here. Uh, and then, yeah, I thought it was it was a nice new angle to take on celebrating the anniversary of Batman uh, by making it about how Batman is still a hero and still brings so much to the table, even though he is just a man and is always there to to keep hope shining in Gotham. 
Yeah, that's a great point, Andy. I actually thought about that right before you said it, that this was this is a great way to address the um, I mean, maybe not necessarily a complaint, but, uh, you know, some people think that, you know, Batman only works as a street level, you know, realistic, you know, vigilante, which they're not wrong that he works in that aspect. Yeah. But he also works in big, crazy superhero stories, too. So uh, this was a, a great way to show that, um, you know, he 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 works alongside the cops and definitely works on street level stuff. But he's also believable. He, he's one of the few fictional characters that you can say that about, too, mm-hmm. uh, because you could see Batman in a murder mystery. But you could also see Batman in a murder mystery on a planet 25 million light years away that's involving, you know, alien life forms that we've never encountered before. And it still works um, as much as I love Superman. Superman doesn't work in every story. Batman works or at least the idea of Batman can work in most stories in my estimation. Right. Cool. All right. Moving forward. Next one is uh, it's another pinup. This one's by art or excuse me. Art is by Jim Chung and Alejandro Sanchez. Um, this one, I, I was so close to loving it. I just don't like the wrinkly limp Cape. I like if they had made the Cape powerful and outstretched, I would have loved this one, but it was kind of a weird choice to make it wrinkly. I could have sworn this was Nick Darrington until I looked down at the the credits, which I can see Jim Chung in the face, actually, like now that I know it's him. But this looks a lot like the stuff uh, uh, Darrington did on Batman Universe. Mm-hmm. So I was I was kind of surprised it wasn't him. Uh, the next one my, is the... Uh, oh, go ahead, Jim. My advisor at my comic book shop is uh, really big into Jim Chung. Like, that's one of his favorite up and coming guys right now i think and uh i'm not sure i necessarily care for the aesthetic choice made with the cape there but i can see why he digs the art because other than that that particular choice i think it looks really good yeah yeah the composition's great just yeah the the cape definitely takes you out of there yeah it was so like it was it was like this close to being amazing and and i just feel like yeah they didn't quite get it there but you're right like the composition is great i love page dough that next Page dough. Oh. <laughs> so yeah, the next page. The, the next page. That's the it's the Liebermejo <laughs> one that is uh again, it's it's the homage back to the old nineteen forties serials of Batman and Robin in their very homemade outfits, but it's it's awesome. Batman looks like he's getting ready to eat somebody and I love it. <laughs> Another unpopular opinion time. I'm sorry. I'm not saying Lee Bermejo is not skilled at all. His aesthetic isn't always my favorite. Um, like in, um, what are the ones he did? Like Joker, uh, Batman, Noel, um, damned every, everything like that. The skill is there. And I won't say that it is not impressive artwork, but just the overly kind of designed and detailed looks and everything is not my favorite thing to see. Um, but strange you say that because the owner of the comic book shop I go to agrees with you wholeheartedly. He doesn't like Bermejo at all for that very reason. But like if he did more stuff like this or his variant cover for uh, for this book, um, which has Batman and Nightwing in like the lower half Mm -hmm. in kind of that overly um, design. Well, I won't say overly designed, the very detailed, the highly detailed, you know, painter quality that he has which again is impressive it's just not my favorite but then in the background it's very much like a 1940s throwback style Mm -hmm. that is that is absolutely perfect and i love this too with uh just him taking that uh you know patchwork suit of batman's and robin with you know the like i joked earlier like the party store you know paper mask that he's wearing um it just i mean it's it's very cornball But he sells it just uh, because, you know, back then when they premiered these serials, uh, you know, people enjoyed them because that's all they had. You know, they didn't have anything really uh, anything else to compare, you know, a Batman movie or show or, you know, a story to in live action. So, you know, uh, as opposed to now, we have more than enough to satisfy anybody's, uh, you know, taste for the character. Uh, but you know, this takes that very much throwback look 
and bring some respectability to it and um uh, you know makes makes it almost you know work um not on like an ironic level i mean you know the the fact that it's you know kind of kind of silly kind of goofy looking because they are clearly homemade uh loose fitting costumes um is part of the appeal and design of it but like like jamie said batman looked like he's about to just pounce on that you know the that mugger there or whatever and uh you know beat him to the point that he wishes he never learned to hold a knife let alone brandish it one at a lady so uh you know bermejo style completely sells this image here yeah he somehow took the really cheap really corny outfits from the 1940s and made them look cool but still kept their homemade aesthetic so that's not easy to do so my hat's off to him yeah listen if somebody wanted to make a batman movie with that costume i ain't even mad at it yeah i'm just saying yeah, I mean, the the actual Cal from those serials was, you know, <laughs> janky as all get out and, you know, clearly, you know, was patched together with loose bits of fabric. I actually really like, you know, his his take on it here. That looks really, really cool. Yeah, I agree. Very cool. All right. Next one. Uh, next is a story called Generations Fractured, uh, written and drawn by Dan Jurgens. Finished art by Kevin Nolan, colorist by Hi-Fi and And World Design doing letters. So it's Halloween night. So you I know, told you you'd love this one, Andy. You know I'm already <laughs> in. I'm like, all right, great. Favorite. And I'm like, okay, Batman, Halloween night in the blue and the gray. We're starting off good. He's jumping against some lightning bolts. I'm happy. He shows up at a museum. And who's waiting for him at the museum? The Universal Monsters. <laughs> I, I'm in. I'm in. It's Dracula, Frankenstein, <laughs> the Mummy, and the Wolfman, and I'm like, okay, this is great. There's no way they can ruin this. So yeah, Batman. <laughs> I know. Shh, shh. We'll get there. Um, so Batman's fighting these monsters. They're not monsters. They're uh, you know, they're they're bad guys dressed and uh, dressed to look like the monsters, and then it seems like they also have some sort of. Uh, technological enhancements to help give them the powers of these monsters. But he's fighting these guys. He's taking them out one by one. He's like, okay, who would do this? Who would start this trouble on Halloween night? Who would throw me up against all these monsters? It's Calendar Man. Calendar Man is there, dressed as the Phantom of the Opera. And I'm like, all right, I'm still into it. I still dig it. We don't get enough Calendar Man. He's certainly not my favorite, but I feel like this is a good way to use him. I was like, great. And so he, he's, he's taking out Calendar Man. They're in like the uh, Thomas and Martha Wayne gallery. And I'm like, all right, man, it's all going good. Then this magical light comes and it reverts Batman back into his Detective Comics number 27 look. And I will say, much like with the, the thing we were talking about with Lee Bermejo, this is a great modern design for that classic look. He looks awesome. Mm-hmm. And so, like, he's like, oh, wait, what's going on here? And so, essentially, he gets zapped back in time. So, he's back in time as his original Batman. And then Commandy shows up with the Infinity Gauntlet and is like, hey, I need your help. (laughs) Booster Gold sent me. I need your help. You got to come with me. I know you're brand new at this, but... uh, Come with me into the time stream. Uh, And Batman's like, wait, what? Okay. So, they get zapped away. And uh, it's to be continued in Generations Future State. So it was a setup to uh, sell this Generations book that I'm not all that familiar with. So, Jay, what do you think? Okay, I know we lost Jamie at Booster Gold, so I'll just keep going from there. Uh, but um, I love I love the setup. I love I love Dan Jurgens' art anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I, 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 lo- I loved his uh, you know writing on action comics and everything. Since this is just a teaser of uh, an upcoming story, um, it's hard to judge it on anything because it's clearly meant to just set up something else that's coming soon. Um, So it is a little disappointing that they end the book with not one, but two stories like that. Um, I wish they would have actually ended uh, the book with uh, maybe something a little more standalone, just as a nice, you know, uh, capper instead of this one and the one following. 
I loved the uh, uh, like Batman going back in time, changing styles, changing uh, outfits over time and everything. And then, yeah, like you said, that uh, Detective 27 look just looks really, really cool. The way that they not just the um, like penciling style changes, but even the coloring gets a little bit simpler. Mm -hmm. So it looks like it's from an older comic. Um, And it's crazy that next page where uh, there's definitely that one homage to that uh, famous you know, uh, drawing a Batman, like on top of a gargoyle with his cape out behind him and everything. Yeah. Um, that looks very Brian Boland ish from the killing joke. Um, and then you've got commandy coming in saying, Hey, let's, you know, uh, go back to the future and everything and, you know, figure things out. Uh, so it is just kind of a, you know, set up for something else, which, uh, I mean, isn't my favorite thing to do in stories like this. Uh, I will say that the the book that it's um, leading into, just the team that Commandy and Batman get together is so weird that I can't help but want to look forward to it. <laughs> it's the two of them. It's Booster Gold, so lost Jamie again. The female Dr. Light, Starfire, Sinestro as a Green Lantern, and Steel. And then they're like going through zero hour again or something like that. And it's like, I want to read this just based on that team alone. So, uh, again, I mean, it looks great. The story really isn't much of anything because it's, you know, a prologue. Um, you know, I didn't hate it. It's just kind of contingent upon what this actual generation's future state actually is Mm -hmm. that this will uh, live and die on. So, um, you know, this is something that I can't really give a grade to because it's almost unfair. Right. Jamie? Well, I've told you how I feel about Tom King's obsession with Batman dying in bed with Catwoman sitting on the bed with him. <laughs> Only slightly less than that does it annoy me how much Dan Jurgens is obsessed with Booster Gold. To be fair, Dan Jurgens created Booster Gold. <laughs> I, that's not an excuse. I'm sorry. No, no. <laughs> You're obsessed I, I with your it. kids because they're yours. Same thing. Even I can have too much of my own kids. <laughs> <laughs> Especially now that the girls are teenagers. Good Lord. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, I, I dig Jurgens. I like his art. I like his writing for the most part. Uh, this just 144 pages. We could have cut back to 120 and just got rid of this and the story that follows it because I don't need ads. That's what I have these these solicitation things that Jay sends me every month for is I can read it and judge for myself whether or not I want to pick up that book. I don't need it the tail end of this book. Charge me eight bucks instead of ten bucks and take those pages out. I just at least like in the case of the maybe the Joker one is the one I read. I think I did because you and Brendan covered the Joker one on the, the show, right? Yeah, correct. OK, so I did read that because that's the one. Instead of having like some kind of a weird, uh, uh, here's what's upcoming in the Batman title with punchline, yeah. they at least give you punchline's origin in there. Sure. You know, something along those lines. I'm okay with that sort of a thing, but like these straight up advertisements for upcoming books, no, nah, get yeah. rid of it. Yeah. I don't need it. I agree. The punchline one was a good way to do it because you don't even need to read the next one because it's still a standalone. It just informs what comes next, but it doesn't end on a cliffhanger. Um, So here's the thing. I mean, as I said, the first two thirds of this, I thought was so cool. I loved it. I I mean, of course I did. It's Halloween night. There's monsters. There's, you know, calendar man, like great. And even when he gets zapped back in time and he shows up in the original outfit, I went, Oh, what's going on? That's cool. Like I was into that too. But then when I realized, oh, they were just setting me up to try and sell me another book, I was like, oh, come on. So yeah, like I was so with it. They just should have made it a little more standalone. You should have given me some sort of resolution because yeah, Commandy, like, sorry, Jay, you probably like Commandy. I have no real interest in him. He's just never been my thing. So I was like, no, not yeah, me neither. <laughs> okay. Where I was like, why is Commandy coming up and grabbing Batman? Like, with the Infinity Gauntlet. I don't know. So. Well, I mean, to be fair, the Commandy Challenge that was out a couple of years ago, where it was like a 12 issue maxi series and like all the major hitters in DC's stable. Basically, they. The, the concept of it is each book ends on a cliffhanger, and then the next team has to pick up from there and say how he gets out of this particular mess. 
that yeah, was that a pretty was, good fun ride. That was fun. Yes, but yeah. Commandy him Commandy doesn't sell a book for me. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. Uh-uh. So, yeah, so I I loved it and then I didn't love it. So, that's where I'm at. But I agree about the art. I thought the art was terrific. He looked great. The monsters looked great. Um, I loved the, you know, the modern look. And then I, I loved the reimagined. I mean, but barely. But, like, yeah, kind of uh, the original look, too. I thought it was really cool. I just wish it was a, a story. Yeah. I did love the newsy on the last panel, though. He was a champ. Yeah. <laughs> all right uh on to the final one this one is called a gift it's written by mariko tamaki art by dan mora colors by tamra bonvillain 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 eh, i don't know uh letters by tom napolitano uh this one is like in context or it's in continuity with what's currently happening with the joker war so uh, it's the middle of the Joker War. It's day three. Bruce is, uh, he's still out there trying to do his thing, but he's, you know, he's lost his fortune. It looks like he's in like a shady motel with all of his Batman gear, but he's out there anyway. And while he is out there, he's talking about some of the things he learned from his father when he was younger, which is nobody really owns anything. Anything can be taken away. So what matters is, is your character, your principles, who you are, because fortunes and all of that can be taken away in an instant, which is what he's dealing with in Joker War. So he's out there doing the best he can as Batman. Uh, at the same time, we meet this, uh, a good cop. It's another good cop one. Um, I don't know this guy. Should I, should I know this cop? I don't know him. Um, I don't think so. No. Okay. Well, great. So there's like a, we're kind of seeing this good <laughs> cop out on patrol. Um, and yeah, so like Batman is out there trying to figure things out, trying to to stop the Joker, kind of comparing what he learned as and, and then what the Joker is doing uh, and how the two don't mesh. Um, but really, I feel like there's not a lot of story here. Um, it's just kind of setting up sort of the status quo and Batman's philosophy and how he's dealing with the Joker war. And then where it ends, it doesn't really end um they they tease this black case book um but anyway it says the mystery of the black case book continues in detective comics uh so i don't really know anything about the black case book but i've only been reading batman i haven't been reading detective comics so maybe i'm just out of the loop on this one so the is mariko the, tamaki taken over for tomasi on detective at some point and i missed it or not that i'm aware of so and, it's kind of weird and, that they... and i know she's not taken over for tynan on the main batman book so my question to you is you have this little segment in here that's like trying to advertise both of the main batman titles which i promise you somebody that bought this book is either already getting those two titles or just doesn't want to get those two titles because they just wanted to get this special Batman book. There's there's not any real upselling being done here. Mm-hmm. And she's not involved with it, so the aesthetic is completely different as far as any writing styles or anything. I, I just I don't know where somebody's head is in the their their headspace is with this and that Yeah, if I, I'm I just, if it doesn't if, make any sense. It, if it, I'm being honest, I was having such a hard time summarizing it because I couldn't get engaged with it. So when I was reading it, I feel like my mind was wandering, you know, like, so I don't, I don't really know what happened in this like, one. Like it's not, it's not poorly written. It's just, I mean, like you said, there's, there's nothing here to grab you. Yeah. Like at all, like the black case book, um, actually showed up a lot in Grant Morrison's extended run from, you know, however long ago. Um, it's like all the, unless they're changing it and uh, uh, changing it to something else, it's all, it, it's pretty much all, uh, all of the cases that Batman has been involved in that, you know, weren't part of continuity for a while, but then Morrison's like, well, everything counts, you know, if, if it fits in the story. So it would take stuff like when Batman would go to, you know, other dimensions or other planets or, you know, he and Robin would uh, go back in time and, you know, become knights for a day or something like that. It, it's like all the unexplainable cases um, or, or something along those lines. So I, I guess it's coming back into play. Uh, I know in the solicitations for Detective Comics and I think like December it's referenced. Um, but 
this is the first actual in-story hint of it. So I don't know what the point of it's supposed to be. And and again, I mean, Tamaki's writing wasn't bad. It's just I didn't care. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. like I, I don't I don't know what's going on. I love, love, love Dan Mora. Um, I wish he would get more like superhero work because uh, he he, uh, d- he he's done like a lot of covers for D.C., um, and he pencils a book called Once in Future for Boom Studios. That's really good. Uh, but I love his his style and aesthetic. And it, I mean, it works great with Batman here. And uh, visually, so visually, him, uh, he and uh, Tamara Bonvalain work really, really well together. But yeah, I mean, like you, like you said, Andy, I, I I could not get engaged with this. Right. I tried to reread it earlier because I had forgotten what it was actually about. And I just, I just couldn't because I was like, well, I, I it just, just doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to me. what happened. Well, and I hate to say that. I, I, I hate to say it too, because like, as we were talking about the last one, the Dan Jurgens one, I was looking ahead. Cause you know, I'm like, I've got to, Oh, I got to summarize this or, or give a synopsis. And I was slipping through it and I was like, Oh shit. I don't remember what any of this is about. <laughs> So, yeah, and, yeah, I'll just own and, it. And Sorry, it, guys. I, <laughs> I had no idea what's going on. I read it. I just, it just did not stay with me and I couldn't engage with it. Yeah. Well, the like we the said, other weird part is this is like some sort of a, an interlude, if you will, for Joker War. And I feel like Joker War has progressed. You know, I've, I've read those books before. I read the Batman books before I read the detective books. So, like, I'm one issue away from being done with Joker War, and I just I feel like that story is deeper, and then this story tried to backtrack on that a little bit, and that also, for me, was weird. Mm-hmm. And that might just be because I read things out of sequence now, but it's... I don't know. Yeah, it, it's, I, I, I'm, I'm I don't, not sure I don't where understand the thought process. I, I just don't get what they were thinking here. Yeah, and, and again, the placement of these last two stories, like, not the inclusion of them is, you know... Like you said, Jamie, they're ads for other books, which is obnoxious, but a, a given with stuff like this, you know, whether we like it or not. But but the fact that they ended this book with this story, especially that's forgettable, completely forgettable uh, that we can't we can't even summarize because we don't know what happens. Um, if it's almost like if they had taken this in the Jurgen story and then moved them back and put the Snyder one at the end, the, the Snyder story ends on like a, a a note of finality. So, you know, Jim Gordon saying, you know, Batman reminds me that everything's going to be okay. As always, that's a great way to end a celebration of a thousand issues of Batman. Mm -hmm. But instead it ends with, Hey, read these other books to see what's going on next. Yeah. And it's, it's just so weird. Yeah. It's like, Uh, like if you're reading this, you can stop reading, uh, before. Yeah. You stop reading it as always. And like, cause the last two don't really matter unless, unless you can't wait to be teased. Well, all right. Anything else to add to that, uh, Jamie? <laughs> no, no, I'm good. Okay, great. Uh, cool. All right, well, there you go. That's the last story. There's one last uh, pin up at the end, um, which is pretty cool. It's black and white. And I like the I like the sketchiness of it. I mean, it, it looks it, it looks like something you'd get as like a, a commission at a convention. So that's good. That's kind of cool. Yeah. It's a, the one that did the Thor book for a while there, wasn't he? Uh, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a uh, Olivier Coipel, um, as the last one. And that is detective comics, 10, 27. So, uh, what is your favorite and least favorite stories in this one? Jay, uh, my favorites, I think I'm going to go with, uh, <laughs> probably the unit net. The unanimous choice, unanimous, uh, um, uh, the unanimous choice of Detective 26. Just um, it doesn't overstay its welcome. It has a clever premise. It's uh, just a great story that leads into uh, what it, it leads into the first story that this entire collection is celebrating. And um, yeah, I, I just loved how how fun and brief uh, and clever it was because it's a quick read. It's a fun read. There's no fat on it. It's very lean, but, uh, you still get a great origin story. And then the entire, 
uh, superhero career of uh, the uh, the Silver Ghost until you're introduced to Batman, and uh, I just uh, I just loved it. It was great. So that's my favorite. Um, gosh, my least favorite. Uh, I don't know. As an actual story, I think I would just go with um, Odyssey, mm-hmm. just because, like uh, like I say, even legacy probably frustrated me more and I may have disliked it more than odyssey as a whole, but I at least liked the sentiment behind uh, uh, legacy. And like, like you were saying, if you, if you took the stuff with future Bruce and Selena out, it would actually work as a story mm-hmm. and yeah. it would be a lot better. But, um, so that's frustrating, but at least it's self-contained. It at least feels like it has a purpose. Uh, and I liked some of the sentiment. Odyssey was a it was just a story that, uh, I mean, I, I said it before. I said it several times before. I mean, it felt like a draft for an idea for a Batman miniseries that they just took the pitch and had somebody illustrate it and then said, you know, here you go. It's it's in here. Like almost like they wanted something from someone with the clout of uh, Marv Wolfman, uh, but he didn't have anything, you know, ready. So they just took something he wrote like back in the eighties and they're like, well, okay, let's turn this into a story. Uh, so Odyssey was probably my least favorite just because it, it didn't amount to much of anything. Nice. Uh, Jamie, what about you? Uh, Detective 26, I think is my favorite. Uh, very, very close, uh, behind that would be the, the Scott Snyder one, but I, I, I think more so than anything, I'm, I'm giving Morrison a lot of credit because Morrison is known to be weird for the sake of being weird. And this was a quirky, unusual type of a story, but it works on every level without being confusing. Like, I, I feel like Morrison goes out of his way to confuse people. I, I think maybe he didn't do any mind altering drugs when he was writing this. <laughs> and that's why it worked out the way that it did. Uh, whatever the reason may be, it, it's the most I've enjoyed Morrison in, in quite some time. And uh, I, I just was supremely entertained by that that story. I mean, anytime I'm reading a, a Batman book and somebody can make me laugh for like a full page at the end, I mean, that that's just that that's an accomplishment to be recognized. Um, my least favorite is Legacy. I mean, I'm over King. I, I want to read King's story that's that's coming up here, the the Batman Catwoman book, and I'm nervous as hell about it, but it's got Phantasm, and I, and I'm 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 looking forward to it, but at the same time I'm just ready to not like it. I'm I'm just I'm over King being with Batman. I want him to write these these twelve issues with this Phantasm story, and I just want him to to go away and not come back. Leave my characters alone from now on. Just go. All right. Um, okay, so, I mean, you guys covered Detective Number 26, but it's it's amazing. That, that one was great. But I also, I really loved the Masterclass, because it's the Bat family, you know? So I, mm-hmm. I thought that one was awesome, because I loved the story, I loved the focus on the family, and I loved the artwork. So, uh, big shout out to that one, too. But I, And I really liked Blowback, the the Villains Parade. That one made me happy, too. Yeah. So, I think all of those were, were my favorites. Um, for my least favorite, I... I will say Odyssey Um, because yeah, like legacy is annoying, but at the same time there was a core of a cool idea in there. Whereas Odyssey, I was like, yeah, I just, I just wasn't into it at all. So that's what I would go with my least favorite. Uh, But still that's detective comics number 1027. It's out there. Pick it up digitally or physically. I say physically support your local comic book shop. As long as you're back in the United States, that's the only reason I didn't get it physically. Um, But pick it up. You know, your mileage may vary on the stories, but there are a lot of options here, and that's the beauty of it, is uh, I'm sure you will find something that you enjoy. Uh, But, good stuff. Happy 1,027 issues to Detective Comics. I like these because they're also nice and easy to do an episode about, so that makes it easy for us. Um, But we're not done with Batman just yet, because we also did watch the next episode of Batman Beyond. So, uh, let's check that out. So, let's see here. 
We are on Season 2, Episode 16, The Last Resort. Uh, this one aired on March 4th of 2000. Uh, it is directed by Kurt Gaeta and written by Stan Berkowitz. So, uh, basically, all the teenagers in Gotham are unruly. Parents don't want to deal it with, with it themselves. And so there's this new resort, camp, place, I don't know, whatever you want to call it, facility where the parents can send their teenagers to straighten them out make them better, make them model citizens. Um, and so apparently every parent has had it with their kids because they all send their kids <laughs> here. There's like no one left in school. And uh, Terry and uh, Dana and their friend Chelsea, they're all like, man, like this ain't good. Like this is like, you know, one of the one of the kids that got sent there. Like, he's not a bad kid. He didn't even do anything wrong. But there he is. He's over at that place. Um, and so Chelsea is like, well, I'm writing a letter to the editor because this is out of control. And that gets her thrown in there. So, uh, Batman is like, there's something up with this place. I need to check it out. So Terry goes to check it out. He goes to visit Chelsea, uh, and he wants to get some video evidence and he manages to get himself caught and get himself thrown in. Uh, there's another guy in there who's like a trouble kid. I can't remember his name, but they have a past. He starts a fight with Terry and Terry basically appeals to him being like, Hey man, like, don't be the guy they say you are. Help me, and we can help everybody. And so the two of them, yeah, they they stage a breakout. They get everyone broken out. The leader of this facility, uh, he gets taken by the authorities, and uh, all the parents realize that they sent their kids to essentially a brainwashing prison or a cult. Um, the leader, I guess the villain of the, of the story, um, he is a doctor, and as I was watching, I was like, God, he sounds familiar. It was John Ritter. Mm-hmm. The immortal, beloved John Ritter. So that was kind of fun. Uh, but anyway. Jack Tripper, baby. Yeah. <laughs> Although there's something missing when it's just his voice and we don't get to see him do Pratt Falls. That's yeah. true. But anyway, that is The Last Resort. Jay, what did you think? All right. So I like Batman Beyond more than the two of you and Brendan. Um, I think as a series, as a whole, I like it more than any individual episodes, but I like the concept. I like the idea. It's fun enough to watch. Uh, I even have the complete series Blu-ray box set right here with a very shui, silver-ish <laughs> Batman Beyond Funko Pop in there. Um, I watched this episode earlier today. I had no recollection of this episode to begin with, by the way. Um, I watched this episode um, at about 19 minutes, 24 seconds. I realized that the last thing I remembered from the episode was around the 11 minute mark. Uh, so I went back oh. to rewatch the stuff where my mind had wandered and I started just, you know, focusing on other things. And then my mind wandered again. So I had to go back again. Um, the setup for it was OK. Um, the, I, I like the uh, some of these story ideas better than the actual execution, like something like this, that Terry would be better at, you know, investigating and uh, um, uh, and looking into more than Bruce, even in his prime. This would definitely be more of like a Robin story in like the animated series. So seeing something Terry could do as Batman more than Bruce could do as Batman helped separate it a little bit from um uh, you know, the, the legacy of having, you know, Bruce as Batman. So made it a little more of a decidedly Terry Batman story, which I appreciated. And the idea was, you know, fine. I actually thought John Ritter's, you know, very soothing, calm performance was kind of terrifying. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, I think the kid's name was Sean when he was like berating him yeah. for, uh, you know, not, not being fully in on the program, just the way he delivered that line was very chilling. And, um, so, I mean, the story idea was okay. Uh, but again, I mean, I just, uh, lost focus and lost interest several times and just never really, you know, paid enough attention to it to, you know, kind of honestly care. I hate to say, uh, I did love Chelsea's letter to the editor where she's like, here's what I think about your decision unshway which was so corny but made me laugh so hard <laughs> uh but i mean i mean other than that this this is just very much a it wasn't a bad episode it was just a it, it was a forgettable episode there, there wasn't an awful lot to it beyond 
an okay concept and a couple of decent moments that mostly happened in the first half. Mm -hmm. Jamie? This episode was perfect. The average. Ah. <laughs> I, I just... <laughs> I can't even say much more than what Jay said about it. it. It had a couple of interesting character moments to it, but I mean, overall, said and done, was there anything overly impressive about the episode? Not really, except for... at the, the, Here's the one disappointment I've got, okay? At the end where he's standing there with Bruce talking and they're kind of like overseeing things, like looking out over things. And he, he says, I bet you brought one of your old costumes with you, didn't you? You'll never know. It's like, that's the episode I want to see. Terry gets in trouble <laughs> yeah. and Bruce has to put on the old costume and go in and get him. Yeah. There, bring me that episode, please. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, I lost interest uh, or okay. Lost focus in the story. So when he said that, I was like, Oh my gosh! Did Bruce like go through that that uh, <laughs> that camp or whatever, uh, and like infiltrate it in a Batman suit? So I mean, I went back to see if that happened, no, and no, sure he did enough, not. it did. He did. <laughs> <laughs> it did. And uh, also, shout out to uh, Bud Bundy being in the episode. Yeah, yeah I, the... I was about to say yeah. There were quite a few like special guest stars because yeah, it was David Faustino and then Rachel Lee Cook. Uh, she was Chelsea. And what's so funny is on the last episode, our guest Spencer mentioned that like, oh, and Rachel Lee Cook was, you know, was on Batman Beyond. And sure enough, here, it, here she is. Uh, anyway, uh, I thought it was OK. Um, it's funny as it started. I was like, oh, I don't know. I don't know about this, like teenager brainwashing camp. I don't know if that's what I want in my Batman episode. Um, and but there's something like really terrifying about that situation that actually like got to me. You know, it's like when someone's thrown into to prison, uh, you know, some innocent person's thrown into prison in a TV show or movie or like some innocent or sane person is thrown into an asylum and they like there's no way for them to get out. This was sort of a, a take on that. And I do find that to just be a terrifying thought of like you shouldn't be there. There are bad things happening, but nobody knows and you can't get out like that is scary to me. So that's the part of it that I think got to me. Um, and I appreciated all the guest stars, but yeah, like it just wasn't, I, I, I didn't get super invested. Uh, what you said, Jay, sort of <laughs> the culmination of it. I did pick up my phone and then I went, Oh crap. I've, I missed how it ended. Damn it. Got to go back and got to watch it again. Um, so yeah, it was, it, I, I agree. It was average. I didn't hate it. I didn't love it. Uh, it had, it had something there. It had some moments, but certainly not my favorite. Um, so what would you give for a letter grade, Jay? Uh, I don't know. A C, maybe a C minus just, just average. It was okay. Yeah. Didn't hate it. Didn't love it. Uh, Jamie. Dad on C without teeter into either side. Okay. I think that's fair. I'll go with you guys. See you sounds good. So that's the last resort. Um, if you're following along, next one up is going to be Armory. So whenever we get to that, that is your homework. Armory. That sounds like it should be a Mad Stan episode, but I bet it's not. Eh, well, only time will tell. Um, now, at the beginning, I did say we were going to do emails, but guess what? I lied. I'm a big old liar because we are two and a half hours in and I got to get to work. Jamie got to get to sleep and Jay needs to get back to reading comics. So I think <laughs> I, I think it's going to be time for a Wayne Manor Mailbox catch up episode, which is fine. I don't mind doing it. And it's also low homework. So I'm going to have to do that. So sorry, guys, for those of you who e whose emails are sitting there and you can't wait to hear them read. It's going to have to wait another week. Apologies. But I did not realize we were going to take so long on Detective Comics. But hey, you know what? It's a big occasion. I don't I don't see the problem. Uh, so we are going to wrap this baby up. Uh, it was really fun. Jay, it was a pleasure having you back. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, I glad to be back. Um, yeah, thanks for having me back on. I enjoyed uh, talking talking some comics again after a little bit of break there. Well, glad we could provide the outlet. Um, tell our friends where they can find you. Uh, you can find me uh, on Twitter. I'm at, at J-A-Y-A-W-S. Uh, that's my personal handle. I actually have started a um, another kind of comics project that I may or may not do much of anything with. More to kind of archive uh, everything that I wrote for comics now, uh, I call it comic pause. Like, you know, you pause a video game more mm -hmm. the idea of just, you know, 
sit back, relax, enjoy some comic. Just take some time out of the day. Uh, that's on Twitter at Comic Pause. So C O M I C P A U S E, uh, and Instagram as well. Same, same at. Like I said, not sure if I'm going to do anything with the site beyond maybe an occasional, uh, maybe like an occasional review or like editorial piece. But uh, anything that I wrote as a review or uh, interview or anything over at Comics Now is on um, comicpause.wordpress.com, I think is the actual URL. Uh, so you can find me there. And um, uh, like uh, Andy and uh, Jamie, I'm in like uh, all the real fans groups on Facebook and always popping in there, watching some uh, spooky movies for scary season. So uh, that's a lot of fun. So uh, yeah, just uh, you know, reach out to me. I'd love to chat about anything. Sweet. Thanks, Jay. Jamie, where can people find you? Uh, Real fans groups on Facebook and uh, floating around here on this podcast. Also on Please Rewind and the occasional Real Fans for Real Movies episode whenever we get around to doing any of those. (laughs) Great. Uh, Awesome. Well, thank you guys. And I already told you where to find me. But thank you as always for joining us and thank you for downloading the show. Please do subscribe so you never miss an episode. And please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. And as Michael Keaton's Batman says, I want you to tell all your friends about me. Uh, Visit HolyBatCast.com and find Holy Batcast on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. That was the other one. Yeah, find us there. Uh, If you do have a message for the Wayne Manor mailbox, we will get to them eventually. You can send those to holybatcast at rf4rm.com. So on behalf of Jay and Jamie, I've been Andy. We'll see you next time. Same bat time, same bat channel. Batcast is brought to you by Real Fans for Real Movies. Remember, the thoughts and opinions shared by the participants are theirs and theirs alone, and do not represent the companies or organizations they happen to work for. I mean, I, I, I got to ask the important question. Which one of you is going to carry me upstairs and tuck me in now? Jesus, I'm tired. Uh, I'm closer. Yeah, Andy's it's going to have to be you. slightly more fit. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a watch. Uh, I mean, yeah, if you can wait days, I, could, I can come help you with that. <laughs> Always an excuse.